Yesterday we were talking about future supply and demand, and then we had a conversation about where we thought resources would come from. Today, this morning, we want to consider how we meet that resource challenge responsibly, and this afternoon we'll take a slightly different tack and think about who we want to engage in this effort, how we continue these conversations with other groups, other interests. To kick off this morning, our first speaker is Daniel Franks. He's the Chief Technical Advisor and Program Manager within the United Nations uh, Environment Program. Previously, he was Deputy Director and a Senior Research Fellow at the Centre for Social Responsibility in Mining at the University of Queensland. Daniel, I think, is going to talk about, if you like, the Cinderella minerals, the things that we often forget. Yesterday, we were talking in the main about high-value materials. There is another dimension. Daniel, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, today to speak with you. Um, I come from the United Nations Development Program um, based in Brussels, uh, where I lead a, a program that's funded by the European Union and the African, Caribbean, Pacific group of states. Um, and today I, I, I want to talk about um, the role of minerals in the international development and maybe to think a little bit differently about how uh, we've been approaching that. My, firstly, my apologies for not being here yesterday. I've just come uh, in from Trinidad and Jamaica. Um, but I am really glad that I can, I can be here for today's session and, um, and uh, get to meet you and, and, and talk about uh, all of the issues that are, that are really critical for, um, for global development, really. I mean, um, minerals and materials are literally the matter that will um, help us to achieve the sustainable development goals. And, and in today's talk, I want to talk about our traditional approaches in international development and then... Um, maybe talk about uh, uh, some neglected areas that we could focus on and bring it back towards the end um, to how we might um, achieve the sustainable development goals. And the key argument of my talk um, will be that if we want to really accelerate achievement of these very ambitious sustainable development goals that 193 nations have signed up to, uh, we need to rethink about the relationship between mining and development because as it currently stands, I think we're neglecting important issues, actors, and development pathways. And there are historic reasons for that, um, but, uh, and, it, and it won't be easy to change our direction, but I think a change in direction is needed. Okay, so where are we coming from? What has been the approach so far? Well, international development institutions like UNDP, like the World Bank, like many others, um, predominantly focus their efforts on improving mining sustainable development in two main areas. The first is the large-scale mining of metals and energy minerals, and the second is artisanal and small-scale mining of mainly gold and, and increasingly tin, tung tungsten and tantalum, um, and precious metals, uh, precious stones, sorry. Okay, so large-scale mining. The, the big focus here is, is on multinational companies and junior exploration companies. Um, the, the idea is that... Um, they're big players in international development, particularly in the developing world, where we're extracting metals and energy minerals, we're exporting those to the developed world. Uh, so that's the kind of situation. And all of the different impact points that the agency use, use are things like putting conditions on finance, um, basically having a set of um, standards by which multinational companies need to follow when they're working in the developing world, um, as a condition of the finance that they receive from the International Finance Corporation or private sector banks. Another way is through civil society pressure and local community pressure. We've seen that. That's an area I've written a lot about myself. Um, the role of uh, local conflict in driving uh, change of, of, uh, of the mining sector. And then also areas around government policy and approvals and corporate industry and policy, etc. The thematic areas I mean, honestly, a lot of it's focused on revenue management. Um, and that comes from uh, all of the literature that came out in the late 80s and early 90s around the resource curse, 
around um, um, this, this idea that the, a lot of the challenges that come from large-scale mining uh, in resource-rich nations lead to macroeconomic challenges and political challenges that need to be addressed. Um, there's also thematic focus on regional government governance approaches, local procurement, um, the idea being that uh, mining in the developing world is largely an enclave economy, so how do we ground it in that local economy? Can we drive um, uh, uh, the backward linkages such that you have good procurement from local, um, local economies, you're employing local people, you're building up skills that can be transferred to other sectors. There's a lot of focus on environment, um, particularly around biodiversity, water rehabilitation, starting to see some stuff around tailings that the um, United Nations Environment's doing, but it's been a neglected area for, for a while too. Uh, and also infrastructure, so lots of, lots of um, focus on shared use infrastructure. Can we build resource corridors so that um, we see um, that uh, enclave economy being grounded in, um, in in other sectors. So, you know, a rail line that might service the mining industry. Can it also service the agriculture sector, etc.? cetera? Um, we also see uh, issues around conflict. Usually in the large-scale mining sector, the, most of the focus has been on local community conflict um, because uh, there hasn't been a huge link to civil conflict. That's been more in the ASM space. All right. And the kind of initiatives that we see, I mean, they're all probably very familiar to you. Um, the Equator Principles is where the private sector banks took on the standard, standards of the uh, IFC uh, performance standards. We see where the UN's been involved. We've got the UN Declaration of if, uh, Rights for, of Indigenous Peoples. We've got the RUGI mandate, which led to the guiding principles on, on business and human rights. We've seen UN Environment was involved in setting up the International Cyanide Management Code when we had a series of um, uh, cyanide spills in the early 2000s, et cetera. So there's, there's quite a lot. It's a very rich um, a area of initiatives uh, in this space where international development agencies are working with civil society, working with local governments, working with national governments, working with industry to improve performance. So that's one domain. There's a lot of work in that space. The second domain is that sits on small-scale mining. And here, uh, it's predominantly been focused on gold and, um, and diamonds, precious stones. We have very large numbers of informal miners uh, in the developing world. Uh, we have uh, some of them organised into cooperatives where it's been formalised. We have some small-scale um, mining being more formalised businesses. Sometimes they're uh, foreign businesses. The Chinese are very active in Africa and, and the Caribbean, for example. Um, and the idea is that um, most of these deposits that are being mined are placer deposits. And again, we're extracting um, raw materials, metals, precious stones. We're not tending to process them and we're exporting them uh, for the use, for refining in the developed world or use in the developed world, cutting um, eventually in the developed world. The thematic areas, oh sorry, the points of intersection, um, there's been a huge amount of focus on trying to convince small scale miners to change the technology they're using uh, so that they can reduce mercury use, for example. Um, we, there's a lot of work on access to markets and, and certification schemes around that, due diligence schemes around that, so that if you want to access a market as a small scale miner, you have to follow a certain set of standards. Um, there's been a lot of training and capacity building, there's been efforts to try and improve finance so that small scale miners can get the finance that they need to um, better formalise their operations. And of course formalisation, so working with governments to try and regularise small scale mining so it's not an illicit activity. Um, because we know that there's you know, a huge amount of people that are involved in this sector and there's a lot of development um, outcomes that can come from a better organised sector. And again, mainly focused on mercury and environment, a bit of stuff on child labour, a little bit on occupational health and safety, and a, quite a lot on civil conflict because all of this um, um, blood diamonds, uh, etc., um, focus activity that you know was in, in the early 2000s um, and led to a whole host of approaches, from the Kimberley process to OECD due diligence to certification schemes like Fair Mind, um, where you, you, you're, you're able to supply. Um, certified material to the market. We've got the Minamata Convention that's just um, 
come into effect around mercury use and you know the international development agencies really do put a lot of money through the global environmental environment facility towards trying to achieve that the eu's got its new conflict minerals we've had dodd frank we've got you know databases to try and get better information um, etc so that's the second domain that's been happening in international development but i'm going to make an argument you'll think it's a little bit strong but i think i can back it up that metals make up a minority of global commodities by production volume and value that the majority of mineral commodities are not exported that large-scale multinational mining companies are actually, relatively speaking, minor players in the global mineral sector, and that the vast majority of minerals and materials that are mined are done hidden from view. We don't even notice it. We don't notice it in all the products we use, the toothpaste we brush our teeth with in the morning, we don't notice that that's limestone. Um, you know, it's, it's fundamental to our lives, but we never see it. And I, I think the reason why is because we have this view of the mining sector that's based on price. When we think about the mining sector, maybe not all of us in this room because it's our lives, but it, out into the general public, the mining sector is the things that are worth a lot. To them, gold is, is forefront in their mind um, because it's valued at you know, $40 million a tonne. That's a lot of money. Um, and we neglect all of the commodities that may be lower priced, but actually are really significant. Dimension stones. Or, sand and gravel. When we think about production, it doesn't even come close. You know, so sand and gravel, we're talking about a 40 billion tonnes per year sector. Um, stone, 70 million, uh, 77 million tonnes. Um, iron ore is just 2 billion tonnes. Uh, gold is 4,000 tonnes. Uh, copper, 20 million tonnes. So let me give some perspective to that. It's a little bit small, I, I, I know. Here we've got the industrial minerals and construction materials, energy minerals, metals. This is global mineral production by volume. This one here that's going off the chart is sand and gravel. All right. Next is cement, um, limestone, lime, gypsum, phosphates, rock salt. You can see here that metals make up only 2.8% of global production of, of minerals. Energy minerals, 13%, and industrial minerals and construction materials, a whopping 84.2%. That's huge. That's really very big. The eight of the top 10 most mined commodities are industrial minerals and construction materials, 28 of the top 40. And uh, I love the statistic that the total historic production of gold fits into three Olympic-sized swimming pools. Just three. Yearly production of sand and gravel wouldn't fit into 10 million Olympic-sized swimming pools. So what does that mean? Well, let's do some rough calculations. What would rough global value look like? If we base that 40 billion tonnes on a price of $15 a tonne, which is relatively conservative for sand and gravel, it ranges between probably $45 a tonne in the, in the developed world to you know, as low as seven in some countries, but you know, uh, in, in Africa, a lot of African countries is up to $15 a tonne we get a $600 billion industry. And that's more than gold, copper and iron ore combined. And sand and gravel is just one of many industrial minerals and construction materials. And the second reason why I think we neglect this sector is because we've called it low value. So economic geologists use this term low value minerals and materials. They differentiate it from high value uh, minerals. And uh, they they do it because it's a low price as a function of its volume or its weight. Um, and it has a low unit value. Um, but its place value can be really high, um, even from a, a price perspective. Sometimes it's very, um, you have to travel distance. And as soon as you travel distance with commodities that weigh a lot, it, it, it ends up being a higher cost. Um, but also, if we think about from a development perspective, we shouldn't use the word low value at all. Because from a development perspective, we're talking about commodities that actually are used in domestic economies. Uh, and so I think that if we use this term low value, it implies that they're low value. It's not, not uh, rocket science there. Um, and we need to reset that. You know, if we want to reduce the stigma of this whole host of commodities that make up the majority of mine material that we use in, in society, uh, we need to use different language. 
And so we've started calling these commodities development minerals. Um, we still use the definition of industrial minerals and construction materials and dimension stones and semi-precious stones, but together as a term of development, um, we, we use this definition. So they're minerals and materials that are mined, processed, manufactured and used domestically in industries such as construction, manufacturing and agriculture. And the key thing that's different is that they're economically important really close to where they're mined. Um, they're fulfilling needs of, of local uh, economies. And we include, you know, development minerals includes all of those um, categories I just mentioned, industrial minerals, construction materials, dimension stones, and semi-precious stones. And of course, if we look at the literature, the geologic and literature, you know, construction materials is a component of industrial minerals. Dimension stones is a component of, uh, of construction materials. Uh, and semi-precious stones are also kind of really interesting, important too, so, so we've included them in there and mostly they're, they're used domestically. So we need to re reconsider this notion of value and from a development perspective, the large-scale mining sector has argued, and this is a, a, a diagram from the International Council for Mining and Metals, um, they've argued that the biggest development contribution of the large-scale mining sector to the developing world is bringing foreign direct investment. Um, then bringing exports, which obviously brings foreign currency, um, government re revenue through royalties and taxation, and then we get to some minor contributions around uh, gross national income, and then pretty low employment, really, when, when we consider it. So metals, they're mined for export. So when we think about it from an economic geology perspective, they have strong fiscal linkages. They bring taxation and royalties. If you've got a system that doesn't allow transfer pricing and all those kind of things, that can erode that. Um, but they have average consumption linkages. They don't really generate a lot of uh, economic activity uh, in, in the economy. They have poor production linkages. Most of the um, resource um, processing, beneficiation and use of those commodities is external, is, is, is internationally in the developed world. Um, and they have poor utilisation linkages. Most of the products that are being developed from those commodities aren't coming back to the developing world. Development minerals are almost the opposite. It's a flip, right? They're not going to bring a lot of foreign direct investment. Most of it's domestic investment. They're not going to bring a lot of exports, although the dimension stone sector, maybe the phosphate sector and, and a few others do have some export component, mica, for example, uh, as well. Um, they generate some government revenue, not usually through primary taxation, because mainly in the developing world it's an informal sector. Um, it does generate a lot of secondary taxation because it creates a lot of economic activity that then flows on to other forms of taxation. But it brings a lot of domestic value addition. And it brings a huge amount of employment, particularly uh, low-skilled employment, which from a development perspective is really interesting. It's really important. Uh, so why haven't we been focusing on this space? Has low fiscal linkages but strong consumption, production and utilisation linkages. And this term, utilisation linkages, is one that we've had to develop as well because the literature on, um, on value chains and supply chains actually doesn't even consider utilisation linkages because it has in its mind export-focused commodities. Right? It, it only talks about the, pr the, the production chain um, as if you were exporting it overseas. So we need to rethink all of that literature as well, and we're starting to do that. So what does that sector look like? I've kind of shaped its importance. Uh, hopefully you, you're convinced by my argument. It's, it's a really diverse sector. Right? So it consists of um, a lot of artisanal and small-scale miners, informal in many parts of the world. It consists of uh, independent contractors, family-owned businesses. There's a lot of quarries out there that are family-owned, passed down through the generations. There are some mid-sized national companies, particularly around those commodities that tend to be exported or have an export component, like phosphates. There are some international companies, but mainly just in the cement sector uh, that operates uh, in many places. So we've just done the program that I lead, 13.1 million euro program, it's a three year program, part of it we've got a research component. And we've, inst uh, we've instigated six baseline studies in six of our focus countries to try and get a handle of the sector. Um, so I'm gonna give you some data from three countries. Um, the first is Uganda, and this data was um, collected by uh, Jennifer Hinton and, and other colleagues um, from, it was, uh, 
um, contracted out to Levin Sources, which is a, an active company in this space. Um, and this, the numbers are staggering, right? So estimated direct employment and incomes of ASM of Developed Minerals in Uganda. Clay bricks, 313,000 people involved in that sector. Um, a total in, um, employment of 534,000 people just in Uganda working across these commodities. Um, and the incomes are better than people would make out. Um, they're higher than the minimum wage and they're providing a livelihood to a lot of people. But they're, they're not incomes that are leading people into the middle class, but they're incomes that are um, allowing them to educate their children, allowing them to um, um, have sustenance, and, and high enough that they're not working on the direct poverty line. And of those 534,000 people, interestingly, 38% are women. And if you take out that clay sector, where it's male dominated, 70% of the workforce is women in Uganda working across these developments. And imagine from a development spe um, perspective, if you want to um, uh, have that impact on a large number of, of, of women that have been marginalised from many economies, um, it's an interesting sector to work in then. This is officially reported and estimated annual development minerals production in Uganda. And the clay brick sector is worth nearly 300 million US dollars. All of these commodities are, uh, are dominated by um, uh, small scale mining, as you can see on that far right column. Far right column, yes. Um, except for um, porcelain um, and limestone. Because you get uh, some of your mid sized quarries um, producing limestone will be kind of um, uh, formal businesses. But the numbers are, are really huge uh, in terms of the the amount that it contributes, we're talking a half a billion dollars to Uganda's economy. Um, and we haven't been focusing on it from an international development perspective. It seems rather strange. And let's go to two small island developing states. Here, the mining sector is not on the radar in either of these countries, really. Um, and I mean, I gave you an example of a very large populous African country. Here's some examples of very small countries. But still, look, the, the importance for the economy is really um, is staggering. There are two active metal mines in Fiji, and there are 68 sites that are uh, river, sand, gravel, dredging sites, and hard rock quarries. Um, yet when Fiji goes to the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining and Metals or any other um, activity, it just focuses on those couple of metal mines. Fiji in the last few years has doubled its number of hard rock quarries, and that's mainly because they've gone on road building campaign. And they're sourcing, of the 600 million road budget, 40 million is coming just from stone. It's a really kind of crucial sector even for Fiji. And I'll talk more about Fiji as we, as we go in terms of, uh, of disasters and climate change. Um, Jamaica. Jamaica, we're, we've got nearly 10,000 people involved in the quarry sector of development minerals in Jamaica. Um, 1,750 direct jobs on the mine site and another seven to 8,000 around the site, so these are truck drivers, these are people that are using the, the crushed limestone to make uh, concrete blocks, etc. The wages are, you know, above the minimum wage. Um, and it's also providing kind of crucial support to rural communities around those, those quarries that, uh, that uh, can't get resources for, you know, things like education and things like that. So there, there is a, you know, a, an informal CSR component that you wouldn't imagine would be there in, in, in a, such a small quarry sector. All right, so what are the drivers of this sector? Well, the drivers are different to large-scale mining. We need to rethink about this kind of very differently. It's urbanisation, right? The, the world is moving into cities, and cities are built from construction materials, right? So, and, and the mining of those construction materials are usually in the peri-urban environments around those cities. So as we have urbanisation, we're going to see this sector get even more important. It's infrastructure. Um, it's the construction sector. It's natural disasters, it's agriculture, and I'll talk about that more in a moment, and it's population growth and industrialization. So when you talk to, to um, organizations like the Africa Union Commission, um, they see development minerals as a way to structurally transform Africa and to feed into green industrialization. Because the mining sector, because of its enclave nature, isn't leading to that structural transformation of 
the domestic economy. It's not leading to a step change in the way that that economy can, can drive its own development through industrialization. So the African minerals actually called on member states, uh, all 45 mining ministers of the um, Specialized Technical Committee on Trade and Industry and Minerals have said to African states, their members, we need to focus on development minerals, we need to have a plan, uh, we need to prioritize it. So I think that we will see some change, but it is taking its, uh, taking its time. So I wanted to finish on some ideas, some things that we're pursuing, some things we'd like to pursue, um, on how we might accelerate the achievement of the SDGs through development minerals. Because I think it's, it's a, a totally different way of thinking about mining and, and development. The first is cobblestones. So the story is that a, um, an, a mayor of Diradawa in Ethiopia, northern Ethiopia, travelled to Europe and saw that a lot of European cities, uh, their roads are built on cobblestones. And he knew that around his, his um, town, there was a ready supply of volcanic material and igneous material that could be cobbled and used. So he went back and started this project with a local university and, and using the, the local resources of the, of the municipality to start cobbling their roads. The interesting thing is you don't have to import asphalt, which is very expensive and, um, and comes from, obviously, um, not from many developing nations. And you can use local materials. And it's a huge employer. It turns out that from this um, Diradawa experiment, um, it's spread throughout <laughs> Ethiopia. And now they're cobbling roads in rural regions, in urban regions. Of course, those roads, you can only travel 60, 70 kilometres an hour on. It's not for a highway. Um, but they've now employed more than 500,000 people, mainly youth and women, um, to stonemason and to lay cobblestones. And they've paved thousands and thousands of kilometres of roads. This is now spreading. It's spread to Rwanda. It's spread to Zambia, where we're working on the Pave Zambia program. It's, uh, we also worked with a quarry owner in Madagascar, where it's a food security issue. So in the wet um, seasons, it's very difficult to transport uh, food between towns on dirt roads, because it gets muddy, etc. cetera. Um, so they're now cobbling those roads. And this quarry owner, to try and convince people that it works, decided, uh, with our support, to just pave five kilometres of road um, uh, free from his quarry, to give people the idea that this is actually something that uh, can lead to some pretty good outcomes. Um, and from an SDG perspective, this is interesting because it speaks to the um, SDG on infrastructure and innovation um, and industry. It speaks to decent um, work and economic growth. It probably also speaks to conflict as well, right? Because if you've got large numbers of unemployed youth, that can be a driver of conflict. So if you're providing meaningful employment in rural areas for these youth, it starts to change, uh, change the, the social dynamic and situation. And like I said, as a food security issue, um, so zero hunger, SDG 2, it also has a, a major contribution. Here's another area we haven't been working on, but is, would be quite interesting. So when, does, when disasters hit, cyclones, earthquakes, the things that we need most are construction materials, and um, those materials are what rebuild cities. When we do, in the international community, what happens is typically after a natural disaster, something called a post-disaster needs assessment is done, a PDNA. Um, the PDNA for Cyclone Winston in Fiji um, in 2015 um, didn't look at the quarry sector. So like I said earlier, they've been increasing um, road spending in, in Fiji, so the sector was very stretched. And the quarry sector is also very vulnerable in climate circumstances as well, because the, um, a lot of the sector, at least in Fiji and Jamaica and other parts of the world, is river gravel extraction. Right? So you have a situation where the thing that you need most after a disaster is probably also the thing that is quite vulnerable to that disaster itself. Um, in Fiji, they didn't look at the quarry sector, like I said. They did look at the two metal mines, um, which had no imp impact on, on the, the, the needs or, of the reconstruction. Um, and they ran out of cement and ran out of quarried material, and it caused the major shortages, caused some big problems in reconstruction. Um, if we're going to think about SDG 13 on climate action, decent work, infrastructure, SDG 9 and 8, then we need to 
think about the commodities that will will drive that disaster reconstruction. So we've been thinking, we've been trying to um, look at well, what would it mean to map out reserves of quarried material that you could get quickly after a natural disaster? What is the licensing or, or um, arrangement around getting that material quickly after a natural disaster? What is the regional role of um, of other countries to provide that material at short notice? What kind of um, stockpiles might be available for some specific minerals that you might need? What's the role of urban mining? How can we reuse that material uh, that has been destroyed in, an, in, a, in a cyclone or an earthquake um, and reuse it back into the reconstruction effort? Um, and these are areas that the international development community hasn't been working on. But when you think about the SDGs and you think about it from a development minerals perspective, these, are, these different notions and ideas come up. I think I've got two more, two more. Okay, in Jamaica. In Jamaica, it's, uh, they have a very large tourism sector, mainly in the north of the island, right? And that tourism sector, like a large-scale mining sector, is pretty enclave. People fly in, they fly out. There's not a lot of direct links to the local economy. All of the tourism um, trinkets um, that are sold to tourists are imported, mainly from China. Uh, and there is a real opportunity in a very artistic community, Jamaica is very artistic, uh, to produce ceramics, pottery uh, material and sell it to that tourism market. But they've been importing clay from the US to do their, their, um, their ceramics work. So we've been working with local artisans in Jamaica um, to build up local skills to, to be able to supply um, um, products to the tourism market and to source that clay locally. We've gone around and tested clay around the country so they can get the clay that they need from their own country, produce um, some beautiful materials. Here you've got some examples. Um, this is ceramic work. This is clay pottery work, really high-quality artistic um, um, uh, products. And uh, I'm starting to sort of drive um, local production of um, products into that market. And the, one of the groups that we're working with is... Um, you know, really drawing unemployed youth into their, uh, into their uh, pottery um, community. And so it's really a way in which you can get local employment um, and local job growth um, and service a market that wasn't being serviced before. Um, actually, yeah, last example, I think. So many of us don't know that eggs are actually produced um, needing large amounts of limestone. So chickens don't lay, we're well, not supposed to lay every day, right? We domesticated chickens um, and, and we, we encourage them to lay every day and they therefore need in their food uh, large amounts of calcium. Even organic feed will be filled with uh, um, crushed limestone. Um, so there's a role of developed minerals already in the food supply chain. But the potential for agrogeology, not just crushed limestone, but crushed volcanics, porcelain, lots of different clays, um, is immense. We can substitute the fertilisers that we're currently using uh, with soil amendment from the crushed volcanics and other materials. Um, not entirely, but to reduce the amount of imported phosphates that we might use um, and supplement it with that volcanic material. But there's just not enough research that's been focused on that space. I understand you had a talk yesterday about this. So that's fantastic. And we'd like to see um, more, more work in this space because it's, there's a huge potential there, um, particularly in Africa where you've got local materials, quarried materials can be used for local agriculture. Um, and it's an, a, a very, very interesting um, area of potential work. All right, so in summary, it's insufficient that we'd target our international development approaches just on the large-scale mining and metals and the artisanal and small-scale mining of um, um, minerals and precious stones. There is an enormous potential for this space on development minerals, particularly when we're talking about domestic economic development and structural transformation. But it is a sector that's largely informal. So there are significant challenges in environment, occupational health and safety, and child labour. In environment, it doesn't produce um, acid metalliferous drainage. So it's very different in the metal sector in that it's not going to le lead to large-scale water contamination around uh, most of the sites. But it does lead to local environmental impacts, sedimentation of local uh, waterways, um, dust, noise, vibration, etc. Um, occupational health and safety is a huge issue 
Um, and there are a lot of informal miners that don't have any um, um, st management approaches or um, um, PPE, personal protective equipment that they're using. There is um, a, a significant a component of child labour in the sector. It's not the child labour you might accept, expect from sweatshops. It's, it's kids working with their families on mine sites. Um, sometimes they're working in roles that you would consider to be hazardous, sometimes they're not. Um, but it is an area that, that needs further work and research. Um, and finally, if we want to achieve those SDGs, we need to think about the relationship between minerals, matter and sustainable development differently. There are new pathways. I've tried to lay out just some of them, but there are plenty more. Um, and by thinking about these neglected commodities in these new ways, um, we can lead to, to quite significant impact, I hope, across a very large number of people. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Daniel, for a most stimulating talk. It's time for some questions. Um, would you use one of these mics so that we can hear you? development what goes around comes around. Back in the 1990s I worked on a what was then ODA DFID funded project called Minerals for Development just to change your uh, and we worked on exactly this area and we had another one called Farm Lime looking at lime, low cost limestone for farmers in Africa. We had another one uh, called River Mining looking at sand and gravel extraction for rivers in Jamaica actually. One of the sure. places we looked at. Um, all that there's, a, there's a, just a couple of quick observations. One is it's really hard to get, you're probably gathering, it's hard to get traction with this stuff. Um, I think the SDGs prevent, provide, um, they're quite unglamorous. Right. It's a sort of background activity that people don't really see. But as you say, it's a major employer, it's a major generator of economic activity. It's not without cost. So you talked about brick making in, in Uganda. And very early on in my career, I started working with brick makers in Malawi. Great, fantastic, brilliant building material. The problem with brick making, a lot of brick making in Africa is absolutely terrible environmental impacts from pure wood. From wood, yeah. Um, and there's a big issue there about how do you pro provide an alternative way of making bricks that doesn't involve chopping down lots of trees. Sure. Uh, the other is river mining, which is you know, a massive problem uh, in terms of uh, the damage. I mean, you alluded slightly to it, but I mean, particularly in Jamaica, they have huge problems with uh, informal extraction, mm. shall we say, of sand and gravel from river. Um, Not so much anymore, but Trinidad, yes, and yes. Well, in a lot, of, I mean, the, the other issue with a lot of these activities <coughs> is in the mining codes in the particular countries concerned, these don't even figure because they're right. not considered to be minerals. They're, they're defined out. And that's, that's, right. that's a massive issue as well right. because right. They, they, it causes all sorts of problems because there are, a lot of them are essentially unregulated activities and, right. and particularly where you've got large urban centers. We've been doing a little bit of work recently around Nairobi looking at aggregate resources around Nairobi and the extraction there is completely unregulated and causing all sorts of environmental problems again. So. Um, really interesting to see there, but don't, th there's been a, I'll, I'll, I'll point you at a few things. So a we, huge amount of work done well, stuff I'm that. not sure there's been a huge amount. We've definitely looked at, at, the, at the past stuff that's been done, and it's great. Of course, this, there's been some work in this space, but in comparison, there is certainly not a huge yeah, amount, yeah, yeah. right? And um, in the literature, I looked at five journals over, five of the journals on mining um, and development over their whole um, um, period of print, and there's a 50 times higher number of journals in metals and energy minerals than there is in these commodities, and yet these commodities are way more in terms of production. So if you think the, the scale of difference is huge. Um, on, on the big issues, yes, there are huge issues on environment, community health and safety in this space, right? But again, we're using, if, we, if we're saying, oh, we shouldn't, be careful to work in this sector because there are big problems. No, 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 I, no I but... Think, I think 
Right, right. But that, but that comes from, what I'm trying to say is that comes from an idea that working in this space will stimulate the space because that's what happens kind of in the, in the large scale mining sector or the metal sector. These commodities are produced because of need, not because of any activities that will be involved. And those clay bricks are going to be produced whether or not we're there or not, right? So it's, it's about is there an opportunity to work in that space and provide um, support for small scale miners to define their own future, define their own solutions. Uh, I guess that's the philosophy that we're in, involved with with our program. Um, the, we, we would certainly like to see, and I think it's probably because most of the international agencies in development pulled out of the mining sector in the late 70s, 80s, right? UNDP was really involved previously. Um, and I think when that happened, a lot of this, this sector dropped off. And uh, because of the resource curse and because of you know, it being in the news, there was still some work in the space of the, of the, of the metal sector and ASM uh, gold, but, you know, it's coming back to it for sure. But yes, please, please do provide me all the material that you can on, on past stuff. I think stuff. we should move on to yeah. another question. Yeah. Could we have the question uh, uh, rather than long statements, yeah, please? Well, like I said, it's a, it's a sector that has a very large amount of uh, women in, in it. They, the challenge is that um, the women that are involved in um, construction materials, so quarry sites, tend to be marginalised within their own cooperatives. Um, but the women that are involved in semi-precious stones tend to organise into quite good mining associations. Like, if you go to Zambia... Um, the the semi-precious stone sectors, the, the women there are you know, very empowered. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's what I'm trying to say is it's, the circumstances and situations are very diverse across the sector. Um, what we've been doing, um, we, when we do our training, we do these things called return to work plans. Uh, so people come to our training. We've trained about 5,000 people so far now. They go back to their, their workplace and they try and implement some kind of project based on their training. Um, one quarry in Uganda actually implemented a maternity leave scheme. This is an, a cooperative, an artisanal mining cooperative in, implemented a maternity scheme uh, on site, which is a, a, a major example that, that you can do pretty interesting things in this space. Um, so I think that, yeah, the way in which we've approached gender in the mining sector is is been neglecting all this. There are a lot of women mining associations that we're working with in our program. That's the way to do it, I think, is to work with women for their own empowerment on site. Um, the issue of child labour, I think, is a hugely challenging one because the kids are on site because their families are on site and there's no chance of child care, right? So coming up with really neat ways of those kids... Um, performing roles that aren't hazardous, because I actually think that, you know, if you talk, I've talked with quarry owners um, that have, have their children working on site, and those mothers are enormously proud of having put their kids through school, so they go to school during the day and then come back and work with their parents, and some of them have gone through university, so it's, it's not, it's, it's a very complex and difficult and diverse thing, so it's hard to say we can do X with that, that SDG, but yes, it's, it's, an, it's an area that we are focused on, and we, we encourage others to focus on too. We'll have one last question and then there will be an opportunity when we come to the panel discussion to follow up on this and other conversations. Richard. Well, it was just really to point out the, the, the conflict potentially with other SDGs as well, you know, 14 and 15 on life on land and life below water. And obviously that has to be put into the mix because the change from uh, to agriculture uh, mod, you know, recent modelling is showing that that's, that's had an enormous effect on biodiversity and you would expect this type of developmental work to have enormous effects on biodiversity because they're mining large areas to get a low-grade commodity. So, well, we, we don't have data, so... Well, we, we're starting to get data. Yeah. So in Jamaica, it's 0.07% of 
is for the quarry sector. Now, if you think of the, the environmental impacts are, are very similar to other forms of land development with this sector, right? So it's, it's clearing of very small amounts of land. You know, we're talking about maybe 100 metres squared, maybe 200, something like that, in a quarry. Um, and um, sedimentation of local waterways, um, you know, a, a few other things as well, right? So um, I guess my argument would be that is very similar to urban development. And the scale of land is much, much smaller than urban development. So we should treat it in the same way as we would treat any other landform use, right? Um, the other, my second point would be involve, getting involved in this sector doesn't necessarily stimulate the sector. This sector is driven by people's human needs, right? People are building their house with the material. Us getting involved is not going to stop them from building it or, or increase the amount of building of it, right? It's going to happen. So if it's going to happen anyway, we need to get involved to, to work on how it's happening. Um, the this only areas what... where you could consider stimulating is probably agrogeology, where you. Sh but then you're shifting from phosphates and other um, fertilizers to these minerals. So it's, it's not to say that working in the space will create more environmental impact, but there are environmental impacts that we should be working on. No, I think that's what I'm saying. I'm not criticizing it. I'm just saying that that's the kind of data you have to balance because if you're going to make a, a de decision, you have to decide which of your goals is the most important. And if the most important is to get development into a country, then obviously if there is a compromise in one of the other goals, you, you have to be able to state that. But I think I'm just arguing that data is needed, I guess. Sure, sure. Yeah, very good. Okay. Let's thank Daniel again. Thanks very much. Our next speaker is Natalia who is based on the London campus of the University of Newcastle. If you could believe that, calls to Newcastle. Right, the floor is yours. Um, good morning. Um, thank you, Edmund and Nick, for inviting me to speak at this conference. Um, it's a pleasure. Um, yesterday, um, there were really good discussion in this room. Um, and continuing from Frank's um, uh, raising the topics of development, I'd like to talk about the opportunities for mining companies to contribute to the UN Sustainable Development Goals in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it's based on a recent paper that has been published in the Extractive Industries and Society with my colleagues from Finland, uh, Juha and Maya. Um, and the paper is available so um, to view. So um, I'm going to talk about... I work in the business school and I teach international business and sustainable development is my passion as well as um, research in the mining industry. So um, I'm going to talk a lot about the um, conceptualization of sustainable development in business, how business management approaches with all its limitation of being very focused on um, corporate goals, how um, especially large organizations <coughs> organizations such as um, multinational mining companies can um, um, incorporate or integrate sustainable development goals. So um, you're all aware that sustainable development goals are um, a legacy and built on Millennium Development Goals. They expanded, they redefine um, again the priorities of sustainable development. Um, they are quite broad with 17 goals and 169 or 68 um, targets and objectives. And um, they obviously work at national level. Um, obviously, here um, again, um, straight away there is a, a conceptual challenge: how to translate national targets to a firm level, um, with all its limitation, um, working within the corporate governance structures. So, um, um, within this space of international business literature and theory. Um, Sustainable development has been discussed uh, previously for quite some time. However, there are still limitations in how international business integrates sustainable development at a firm level. So, um, Kolk and her colleagues have reviewed the, uh, the literature on how multinational enterprises interact with sustainable development goals, and they have identified, identified these five Ps, which is a very popular coining um, some major topics in business with uh, um, 
starting with the same letter. So poverty, prosperity, planet, peace, and partnerships are seen as a focus, um, as SDG on which international business can work and can contribute towards. Um, that's not to say that the others should be left alone. And I think sustainable de development goals are important in the sense, although there are a lot of critics of the framework um, in general, that they focus again on the very social aspects of sustainability and um, again posing new challenges for businesses how to uh, work with, with this agenda especially international business working in developing countries that are facing those challenges every day. So from the um, very theoretical perspective, looking at generally, not only mining, but businesses in general, how they interact with sustainable development, and what is the conceptualization with which we work um, of the role of business in society and sustainable development. One is markets, and we've heard about it today and yesterday a lot, contribution to trade, business development, infrastructure development possibly, and development of products and services that we also uh, require. And the implementation of um, some of the important sustainable development goals themselves. Relationships, uh, working with suppliers, businesses or supporting um, local uh, businesses and entrepreneurs in localities. Innovation, um, again, um, a lot was talked about it um, yesterday, about developing new uh, products, um, technologies, but also developing soft um, innovation, new inclusive business models. Um, in the space of foreign direct investment and international business, there is a huge reliance that international business comes into um, um, a location, and not only with investment, but um, can contribute to pos positive spillovers of knowledge, sharing skills, um, and um, incorporating regional economies um, in international markets. And lastly, um, um, responsibility, social responsibility also, uh, we, we've heard about yesterday, social license to operate, um, business ethics, how businesses um, incorporate and address human rights, um, how they implement corporate social responsibility in their business operations. And there are three broad views of how businesses contribute to sustainable development. So number one is taxes, and some companies see it very um, in a limited uh, way that um, corporate contribution to development is only through taxation, and uh, it's, a, it's a business of government then to deal with social development and social investment. And there are challenges in this area too, um, uh, demonstrating transparency, and especially in developing economies um, where we are aware, um, in emerging economies as well, there is a concern for um, corruption and the, um, the, the frameworks such as EITI looking at the transparency and tax contributions of companies. Number two is embedding sustainability business in business operations. And this is an area where businesses and also mining companies have been um, very active in the past 20 years, embedding sustainability in business operations across all the different uh, processes and um, actors with, uh, such as employees, communities, um, suppliers, customers. So um, a lot of progress has been achieved in this field. And the third broad view of business contribution to sustainable development is provision of public goods, um, going beyond um, the, bus the immediate business sphere um, to education, health, and infrastructure. This is a very challenging area. Um, it is recognized by scholars that um, although it is um, um, an opportunity to space to work in for companies, for-profit businesses, there are obviously um, very um, clear structural challenges for companies to engage in this area. However, I believe that sustainable development goals bring um, businesses and industry to this um, um, area where taxes and embedding sustainability is not enough. So companies should be working more in the third area. So I want to discuss what are the challenges of working on this third area, provision um, of public goods further on. Um, 
if we look, um, I've took an example of SDG number one, uh, alleviating poverty and thinking what are the business frameworks um, either developed by academics or um, developed in the industry and by companies themselves, looking at how, what are the models, what are the business approaches and strategies and tools available for companies. And there are many business frameworks that are currently operating. Um, first of all, stakeholder theory, bottom of the pyramid, microfinance, CSR, triple bottom line, um, uh, supply chain management, CSR reporting, environmental management, public-private partnerships, and business and human rights. And you, uh, we, we can find these um, elements in um, operations of many mining companies and in their reports, um, and they have done a lot of progress in these areas. Um, other areas that are also uh, working, such as access to goods, uh, products and services, knowledge transfer and nurturing local talent. Although there are some limitations for employment and um, local employment specifically in um, multinational mining companies, given the specialist nature of this business. And I must admit, um, even in the business management literature, there are gaps in conceptualization, how business can engage with large social societal challenges such as poverty. There are um, um, gaps in conceptualization of stakeholder, how marginalized communities that are experiencing poverty, hunger, and poor health can be related to business operations or business strategies. Um, and how can a view of a stakeholder be extended to um, those who are experiencing poverty? Um, and obviously, stakeholder are actors that, uh, stakeholders are actors that impact or influence the business, but also these are the actors which businesses take into account in decision making. And businesses take into account um, in decision making those actors that have attributes of salience, of legitimacy, urgency, and power. So obviously, a lot of the marginalized stakeholders do not have those attributes to be able adequately um, represented in decision making or um, um, in strategies and business strategies. So there are um, approaches already um, developed uh, for, I mean, if, if we are looking for SDG number one, poverty, um, these communities could be suppliers, consumers, um, part of the local communities, there could be potentially employees, business partners or competitors, if you are talking about informal economy or um, informal mining as well. So um, I just want to move along and um, look at some of the already current um, ideas around uh, business response to sustainable development, and many of them are already used by mining companies, such as um, developing corporate social responsibility strategies as a business response to sustainable development. And there are three major ways that businesses do that. First one is in-house, embedding sustainability in business operations in human resource management, supply relations, community relations, and so forth, even operations as well. Number two, outsourcing. Um, this is also very popular in the mining industry through organization of corporate foundations. And number three is building partnerships. So sustainable development goals have number 17 is partnerships, which is seen as a way of, I think it's an invitation for all the different uh, parts of the community, sectors of the community to contribute. And this is where businesses can take it as an opportunity to um, engage in the um, agenda. And obviously there are some uh, approaches, top down, focusing on several SDGs and integrating them across business operations, or bottom up, targeting a social problem, um, such as for instance, urban waste management, um, that has relevance to several um, sustainable development goals. So um, there is um, a lot of advice available out there, although sustainable development goals been launched in, um, officially from 2016, already um, there are organizations that have been working in this space that have redefined their advice on um, aligning business strategies to the recent sustainable development goals. The first one is World Business Council for Sustainable Development, has launched um, a SDG Business Hub, and is promoting an interesting approach of sustainable landscape. And I think it would be quite relevant 
for the mining companies themselves that are impacting on the landscape. Number two, um, Global Reporting Initiative, you are all aware um, that have been um, uh, um, adopting triple bottom line in um, measuring the impact and reporting on impact of uh, businesses. They, are, um, they have produced a report um, measuring impact, how businesses accelerate the sustainable development goals. And I think this is a very important initiative that proposes and digests to the firm level what sort of um, indicators can be used at um, business level to um, engage with sustainability. And number three is um, UN Global Compact, which is um, um, focusing on targets, innovation, and measuring impacts. So uh, broadly, um, these organizations, there is a consensus on how to engage for businesses generally with SDGs. First is to understand SDGs, define priorities, set goals, integrate and report and communicate. Um, these are very uh, management type of approach to SDGs and um, a lot of companies already starting to use this advice. Um, in the sector, in the mining sector, um, last year um, UNDP and several other organizations have mapped um, mining to the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, they first produce a consultation document and then an atlas. It is a very useful um, type of um, exercise where sector-specific recommendations were drawn for mining industry, um, linking all the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and its subheadings and targets with mining sector activities um, and the existing strategies. Um, again, I must admit this is um, a very useful document. Um, often it is, stays within the approach of taxation and number two, which is embedding sustainability in business operations with the scope of current activities. It doesn't as much um, um, relate to uh, investment in the provision of public goods. And what we suggest in our paper um, is that the industry can take a step, a step further and um, develop a more contextualized, uh, regional, uh, region-specific approach. Um, so this work is only beginning, um, in my view, and mining companies are, um, uh, the large mining companies already recognize um, um, SDGs and commit to them, and they've started mapping their current sustainability activities, current CSR activities to SDGs, and I think it's a, an important step obviously in this direction. Um, um, so um, at the moment, reaffirming their commitment again. Um, some are, um, you know, having a more complex type of mapping, such as BHP, developed the social investment framework um, and uh, linked all the current um, um, sustainability um, areas that they're working on and the sustainable development goals. So in our paper, what we did, we um, looked at um, uh, top uh, mineral exporting countries in sub-Saharan Africa using the data from the World Bank. And also, um, we, we used the, um, on a very um, sort of basic level, uh, trying to look at countries where um, the share of uh, mineral ores and metals in uh, merchandise exports is significant, and also tried to map on the indicators, all the 17 um, um, SDG um, ab, um, goals and choosing individual objectives and individual possible indicators to measure from the World Bank database um, to see um, where potentially mining industry as a whole can contribute. Obviously, um, why I'm talking about mining in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, we are all aware that Africa would be more important in the future um, for the strategic critical minerals that um, developing developed countries are, 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 um, are concerned uh, about supply. But also mining is contributing heavily to the economies of some countries um, here expressed as uh, mineral exports. I mean, I recognize that mining is not only for exports as Daniel um, just outlined, and there are many more different types of 
organizations in the mining industry, informal miners, small scale, or medium types of enterprises, domestic enterprises. Um, obviously here we are talking about foreign trade and often that is related with the foreign direct investment. Um, I'm not going to show that there's a whole huge big table that we put in the, um, in the paper, but here are two examples. Uh, SDG 3, I'm sorry, it's a mistake, good health and well-being, and SDG 6. So um, the target, for instance, for SDG 3, good health and well-being, by 2030, reduce the global maternal mortality ratio to less than 70 per um, 100,000 live births. So an indicator is already available from the World Bank database, mat uh, maternal um, mortality ratio. Um, some of it is estimated and uh, modeled. And we, if you look at the um, sub-Saharan African countries, we see obviously there is a long way to go to achieve this target by 2030. And some of these countries are um, where mining is really important for economic development. Uh, SDG 6, clean water and sanitation. Uh, we hear a lot about nexus between mining and water, so this is something which comes a lot uh, quite frequently. So the target is by 2030 achieve universal, equitable access to safe, affordable drinking water for all. So meaning 100%. An indicator could be an improved water source, um, say for instance in rural area we, we've t have taken here as a lot of mining is happening in rural areas, percentage of rural population with access to um, drinking water. So again, um, looking at the numbers, um, some countries have really a, a long way to go to achieve that 100%. Now, um, what are the, um, if we map, so there are various, um, so we, we, we mapped uh, here, um, shaded improved water sources in rural, uh, or to rural populations, and um, ores and metal exports, and trying to map where, you know, there is uh, any relevance between the mining industry um, and its ability, capability to contribute to some of those um, concerns. So um, there are four major, in terms of water, uh, four major different categories of countries in terms of its current um, access um, to water. But, I mean, it just shows that there is a long way to go for developing countries um, in sub-Saharan Africa towards achieving some of those sustainable development goals that are at a national level. Now, um, since mining is, um, in some countries, is a significant industrial sector, um, there will be questions by 2030 when countries will be reporting um, what did the industry do to contribute towards the sustainable development goals. And I think the time is now to think about it for mining companies, how they can um, contribute to this um, to this agenda. So there are two broad approaches in corporate social responsibility at the moment. Do not harm, preventative approach to reduce negative environmental and social impacts. That comes mostly from the environmental management, do not harm. And second, do good. It's a proactive approach um, to actively contribute to the positive environmental and social benefits. And obviously, number, um, do good is much more useful towards um, contributing to some of those challenging social areas. So um, what I would argue and what we argue in the paper that um, partnerships uh, for the provision of public goods could be an opportunity for companies to contribute um, to improving education, health and infrastructure. And um, here what would be important is not only to map uh, current corporate activities to SDGs, but also to um, match them or combine them with regional development priorities and looking what, uh, where um, can um, companies can contribute um, further. So um, I, I recognize that I am uh, eating on time. So uh, some of those priorities would be physical infrastructure, development of renewable energy, and contribution to health. And of course, um, companies already have created models, useful models that they can still use um, in partnerships, um, but also 
not only the hard investment that is obviously needed in, um, in, pro in progression towards SDGs, but using business capabilities, sharing skills, managerial engineering, knowledge, geological business, access to global markets, and actively promoting economic spillovers. So we are making um, several recommendations in the paper on <clears throat> um, doing more research and partnerships and improvement of practices. And obviously there is a lot of space for academics and businesses to collaborate and think about what possible indicators can be developed to um, map uh, the, the progress, what possible innovative solutions can be suggested for companies to engage in um, 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 SDGs, um, study some of those um, elements of um, mining contribution to development, um, looking at the spe uh, country-specific case studies, and obviously um, there are uh, plenty of different institutional, economic, and social conditions uh, which relate to SDGs. So, but some of the steps that we would recommend um, adding to the existing um, ideas how businesses integrate with um, integrate SDGs is to commit to SDGs, map SDGs, look at the regional priorities, collaborate, and obviously measure measure impact and report. So, um, um, I, I do recognize there are a lot of conceptual and policy challenges of translating national um, sustainable development priorities to very much business level and how to make it a business priority or part of business strategy. Thank you very much. There will be time to pick up a number of the points that uh, Harry has raised later, but is there one quick question now? If there's not, we'll move on. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Gordon, who is um, the Society's Secretary for Foreign and External Affairs, is also the founder and director of Satara Risk Management Consultancy. She's going to develop this theme further. Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you very much this morning. I think what we've just had is a really great overview of the sustainable development goals, so fantastic ambitions for where we want to be going. Um, and social responsibility is one of those aspects where those goals really hit the road. Okay, this is where we make these aspirations real, um, especially within the mining sector as a whole. Um, so what is social responsibility? It can be defined in many, many different ways. But Tom Butler, who's the CEO of the ICMM, who, who you've um, heard referenced many times over the last couple of days, um, spoke about it being doing good, not just doing well. And this was in a, an article in the Daily Telegraph earlier on this year. Um, so as an example of what this means, it means we're not allowed to walk away from sites such as this. This is an old sulfur mine on a, on a Greek island that I was lucky enough to visit earlier on this year. So we can't just walk away from these things, even if they do make great tourist spots. Some people in this room might recognize themselves in this photograph. Um, yes, this features as the 11th most exciting thing to do on said Greek island and is wonderful for geology. So I do recommend you all go. Rather than abandoning these sites, um, what we can be doing instead is setting up things like mining museums, etc. And as you can see, this one is especially fantastic. Um, Professor Richard Harrington, even in the visitor's book, yes, Richard, you did write this. Okay, so for the Milos <laughs> Mining Museum in Greece, really interesting displays, excellent and well-illustrated material. Thank you very much. Um, and so you will be glad to see that as of this month, the museum was number seven out of 64 fantastic things to do on the Greek islands. So um, these are examples of social responsibility really coming home to roost. Um, but when we're talking about social responsibility, it is not just putting it, it, it it's in its box of sustainability, of sustainable um, development goals. We need to look at it within that context of geology and the technical um, activities of extracting, be it aggregates or be it things like copper out of the ground, and then also the financial sphere as well. So we need to be looking at doing good, not just well, in the full context of mining, not just in the what is sometimes hold, um, pigeonholed as being the sustainable development bit of mining. So 
to try and look at social responsibility um, in different types of contexts, um, one of the ways I'm going to try and do this now um, is, is by spreading out our life cycle of our mine into exploration, projects, construction, operation and closure and picking out specific examples of where social responsibility um, activities have either gone right or they've gone wrong. So, exploration, um, this was a field camp that I was lucky enough to be a part of back in 2005. As you can see, it's quite a large field camp. Um, as exploration <coughs> geologists, um, there is this uh, vision that when we fly out there into these frontier zones, we're confronted with this blank canvas. Any people that we meet, they've never seen people that look like us before. So it's our responsibility to be caring um, and aware of their environment and how we might inadvertently impact on them as a whole. So if we, if we look at this particular area, this is in northern Quebec, so it's at the top, the very top of the Ungava Peninsula. And this is an area where there's lots of nickel sulphide. Um, it's in the Canadian tundra, so therefore there are no cars, there are no trees, there are no people, there are no buildings, but there are lots and lots of caribou, especially at certain times of the year. Um, so whilst we say there are no people, actually there are, okay, and the local town to this particular field camp, which was a half an hour helicopter ride away, yes, when I was working here I got to fly to work every day in a helicopter, it was amazing, um, the local town is a place called Saluit, um, as of 2011 there were approximately 1,300 people who lived in this town, um, it's relatively new, um, it used to be a trading post in the early 1900s, and in 1957, the Canadian government set up a day school here, and that was as part of a big initiative to try and provide more stable, um, static communities in this part of the world, rather than having groups of people being nomadic, which was their, perhaps their, their natural state. So the day school was opened in 1957, and as I mentioned already, this area is perhaps blessed with having lots of nickel sulphide in the ground. Um, and so in 1995, an impacts and benefits agreement was signed with one of those mining companies. Now this is an example of what was thought to be social responsibility, because what the mine was doing was sharing some of the profits from its activity with the local community. However, what this did was it flooded a very poor community with lots of money. And what do you do with that money? Well, when I went there in 2005, I'd never seen so many massive TV screens, so many quad bikes, skidoos, etc. I'd never seen quite so many. Um, so yes, there can be lots of things that people can buy, but also as well, it can lead to um, lots of less nice things happening as well. Um, and what you have here is a lovely award, but it's awarded for really quite um, distressing reasons. Um, this is a Canadian teacher, Maggie McDonnell, um, who was awarded $1 million for her work that she did in this community to deal with teenage suicide rates. Now, this is a community of only 1,347 people. Yet, when she arrived in Saluit in 2016, she went to the funerals in that year of six young men between, who had been between the age of 18 and 25 who had committed suicide. 50% of young females in this area subjected to domestic violence. Now, this is not solely due to the mining activities in this area. There are many other factors that are going on there. Um, and the mining continues to this day. People continue to explore there to this day because there are very useful minerals there in the ground. But if we want to go and enact some of these projects and turn them from exploration projects into projects, mines, etc., we're not doing it on a fresh, clean canvas. There are many more very, very complex issues that we have to deal with before we start doing this or before we make the decision to go and mine in these areas. So the complexity of social responsibility within exploration is perhaps more complex than we um, naturally think about initially. Moving swiftly on to projects, um, one of the, the biggest areas that um, is a problem in projects is um, delays that are caused by not getting your permits on time. There are many studies around this. And uh, many of those permits that as you, people struggle to get are the water permits. Um, and um, one of the reasons for this is that there is a, a gap between company expectations and community expectations. The communities have the first right to that water, and only if there is some water left 
can the company then use it? Um, and so as a result, what this has been driving is lots of novel approaches to the technology that we might need to use when we're mining. And it's only when you can prove to the community and then to the government or the people who are awarding those permits that you are dealing with this and you're not going to leave that community short of water, will you get your permit to progress? Um, so just to give an example of this, and there are two examples here from Anglo-American, one good and one bad, just to show that I'm not biased towards any particular company. Um, on the left-hand side here, you've got news that came out earlier this year about the Cay of Echo project, which is a large copper project in the south of Peru. Um, and this is an example of Anglo-American setting up a dialogue table with all of the key stakeholders in that particular area to get them to discuss what were their real problems here around water? And it was through this dialogue table approach that Anglo managed to get their water permit for this project. And also because they maintained those connections and those relationships with those different stakeholders, during the last few years where there's been a downturn in the industry and the Cay of Echo project was slowed down in terms of how quickly it was going to be developed, those permits were retained, whilst many other companies who, if they'd actually managed to get their permits, lost them because they didn't keep up that social dialogue with regards to what was needed. On the right-hand side, um, this is an example of, of Anglo's Minas Rio project, which is a very large iron ore mine in Brazil. Um, it was a project which was very delayed and over budget when it finally came online. And what Anglo is facing at the moment is a delay in its third phase of permitting. Now, if those permits, which are water permits, are not gained, this very, very large mine will be shut next year. And those permits are being delayed in part due to other examples of things that have happened in Brazil over the last few years, such as the San Marco tailings dam disaster. And the reason why, one of the reasons why this permit is being delayed is that the method of mining and transportation that Anglo-American is using in Minas Rio involves the requirement for lots of water. So they need a really large water dam up by the mine. Um, and it's around that that they're struggling to get the permitting. Um, yes, Anglo would have struggled to get this permit anyway if it hadn't been for the San Marco tailings dam failure, but I suspect it's only got worse since then with regards to it. So, projects and permits, there is a problem there, and that much of the effort is around working with your local communities. Construction, when we get into construction phase, this generally involves thousands of construction workers going to a small community. Some of them might be drinking alcohol, which at the end of the day, yes, you might have a mine, but you might also have created many other little people perhaps, along the way. Um, and um, so this is an example of a, another project in Brazil. Um, and in this particular example here, the teenage pregnancy rate increased dramatically during the construction phase, primarily because you're bringing lots of men who are not with their families into an area where there are people who are maybe not used to having such a large degree of attention, shall we say. Um, and this is an example where lots and lots of companies do is they um, involve NGOs, for example, so Care International, Rep Latina, etc., to help manage this situation because you maybe don't have that kind of resource in-house to deal with these short timescale projects with regards to these thousands of workers as a whole. So construction phase brings a lot of disruption to a local community. Moving quickly on into <coughs> operations, um, now, obviously, a mine can be open for many decades, okay? At least we hopefully plan that it's going to be open for many decades. Unlike Minas Rio, we want it to be open for long, please. Okay? Um, most of the complaints from the local communities are around lots of dust, lots of noise, and non-stop activity. So trucks driving around the whole place, lots of lights, etc., on 24-7. Um, but also what happens during operation is because we're using lots of people, we're generating very large communities somewhere near to our minds. And again, there are many studies that have been done on the number of people that are dependent on a single mine worker. So how many people are brought into a local community, but also how many indirect jobs are generated due to a single um, mine worker's job. And, and this is really interesting because it means that as a mining company, you're suddenly generating towns. And we've been doing this for many, many years, and actually we're still getting to grips with how do you look after these towns, not least because when you come to the end of your life of mine, what do all those people do? 
Okay, this is one of the big problems that we have, and I think there'll be some talks later on today that will talk about what happens when we get to the end of life of mine. Um, some of the things that, um, or the social initiatives that are in place, there are lots of fantastic social enterprise projects <coughs> that are out there that allow people to stand up on their own two feet, start their own businesses, be entrepreneurs, and therefore have some legacy and longevity after that mine closes as a whole. So this then brings us into closure, and this is what we expect to see when we're talking about mine closure. We want it to be safe from a community perspective. We want all of the waste to be managed. We don't want it to suddenly slide down a hill and, and uh, bury us in our villages. Um, we want, if there is a town, it to either survive or the town to be downscaled in a managed manner. Um, and yes, we want that mine to be closed permanently, or if it's something that, where there can be byproducts that can be mined in the future, that to be done in a managed way. Um, and so this is one aspect of, of mine closure, but also things that you can have on the closure side is um, this is a house that has been built, built out of waste which was process, processed from um, acid mine drainage in the coal region in South Africa. So this is a situation here where lots of mines have not been closed properly, which is the case obviously with most of the British coal mines. Well, what do you do with that waste? What do you do with all that acid mine water that's there? Well, one of your examples is you maybe don't need to go and dig lots of aggregates out of the ground, because yes, with a bit of extra money, quite a lot of extra money, you can go and build houses out of gypsum that are reprocessed mine waste that you have here. So there are lots of different things that you can look at with regards to that value chain of mining. But if we pick up on some of the questions from yesterday and think about, well, what does this mine of 2050 look like? And 2050 is just around the corner. It's not very far away at all. And we think about those closure objectives and what we're doing at the moment Will these still be the, those objectives that we're looking at? Well, I hope that safe closure will actually be just normal. This will be business as usual. So if you think about the mines that are open today, that we will be closing by the time to, uh, we get to 2050, closing them in a safe way will just be normal. It's not going to be putting a piece of grating across the top of the mine shaft and hoping that nobody goes in. It will be done in a safe way. What about waste management? Well, again, lots of discussions yesterday talking about Everything is a product. Why do we even need to have waste? Lots of the stuff that we're mining, if we're mining copper, lots of that waste could be aggregates that goes into the roads. And we've had a fantastic talk already today about the value of all those building products, etc. So why do we even need waste in the first place? So maybe that won't be a problem. Maybe not by 2050. Maybe it might be a little bit further away in the horizon, but hopefully <coughs> let's be thinking about that. How about community legacy? Well, by the time we get to 2050, there's going to be a lot more automation. And if we've got lots more automation, it means we don't need so many people, which means that we don't have such a big problem with regards to generating large towns and settlements around our mines. So that means that we don't have so much of a community legacy anymore. Okay, am I extrapolating? Yes, I am. But I think this is something that comes with automation. It actually downplays some of that social problem that we have as well. And then with regards to closing permanently, if we get the other stuff right, then that won't be a problem anymore. Um, so quickly, just to, to bring us um, to conclusion, when we're looking at this value chain, we have to look at it as a single entity. Um, and what we do at the moment is we tend to break it up into different bits. So you have your exploration team that think about the exploration social responsibility. You have your projects that think about the project social responsibility operations and then closure kind of gets left off in the far distant future. This is exacerbated yeah. by different people or different organizations populating those different spaces of that value chain. Um, and obviously we've got lots of time horizons in there as well. Why is this a problem? Well, those short-term decisions, i.e. those 10, five-year time horizons, those short-term decisions are generally driven by financial types of risk. People want to get their money back, and you've got a higher chance of getting your money back if you break things into short time horizons. There's more certainty there. And that's a problem because most of those sustainability, such as social risks, are really long-term. And it's only by thinking about our value chain as a whole can we actually balance these. Um, and this is something here where we link it into the technical aspects of the business. So what sort of innovations do we want? If our decision making is purely based on financial reasons, then we tend to go for those conservative, tried and tested technologies. 
We don't go for the lovely blue sky way of doing things because actually we don't want to take the risk because we want to make the short term money back on what we've got. If we go for the long-term side of things, that then forces us to think outside of the box and to dream up new ways of mining. So how can we push that into the future? It also allows us to access new minerals, do new things with those byproducts that we've got there as a whole. Um, this is perhaps one of the reasons why, and I've, I've put this in overnight. Yesterday we talked about serious minerals um, and it being the hidden mine. I'd suggest that the only reason why this mine is hidden is because of the social responsibility aspects that have been forced on serious minerals um, during the process of them getting their permits. They want to mine phosphate in a national park in Yorkshire. That's really difficult, and you cannot do that by creating a massive scar on the landscape. It's just not possible anymore in the UK. It's not socially acceptable. So therefore, the social responsibility challenges have therefore forced this particular company to do things in a fairly novel and new way. And so therefore it's driven the technology agenda, which is fantastic. Um, and it's allowed us to look at that value chain as a whole. This mine almost looks like it should be looking when it's closed. So therefore they've also saved themselves loads of money in closure costs because they've pretty much already done it. I should also mention that this hasn't been built yet. This is just a mock-up. <laughs> <laughs> this is the future. Okay. So... Beyond the borders of the mine of 2020, this is what we're looking like at the moment. So encapsul to encapsulate yesterday, we're going to have changed demand. We're going to have different minerals that we need to be mining out the ground. We're going to have different technologies that we can use to do them. We're going to have different skill sets um, and people to deal with. Um, we're going to be using all of the products that we've got, which takes us into the circular economy as a whole, being able to recycle all of those products. So this puts mining very much as a Kickstarter into that circular economy. We should be very much a part of that discussion rather than the evil cousin who gets forced into the corner. We are part of the circular economy, especially when it comes to social responsibility. Social responsibility is not just something that is done on site. It's done at company, company level. It's done at national level. That's how we need to think about it in the future. So in summary... Social responsibility is not just social enterprise programmes or examples of where we've got case studies of good practice. It is something that needs to be prolific across the entire sector as a whole. Um, the requirements and challenges with regards to that social responsibility change depending on your context, whether you're an exploration project or a mine or a closure pro programme or whether you're mining in Africa or whether you're mining in Canada, etc. All of this changes how you do it. We need to look at the big picture. So beyond our mining time, in terms of time and space and application, what we're doing there. Um, and even if we don't know what that future will look like, social responsibility is always going to be there. Okay? So we might not know what the technologies are that we're going to be using in the future, but there are always going to be people around. So we do know that that is a stable thing. So go, to go back to, to uh, Tom's description of social responsibility that I showed at the, at the beginning, we as a sector, always need to be doing good, even if our plans to do well don't always work out. So people and social responsibility should be coming before profit, or at least making sure that that is front and centre, rather than profit coming before people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. If there are questions, and I'm sure that are, can you... Hold them for now till we, we come to the summary discussion at the end. Yeah. And Francis, to take us to coffee, <laughs> would you like to give us your paper? Okay, thank, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Edmund. Uh, good morning. Okay, so from here until coffee, we're just going to take a slightly different view and think about responsible sourcing of minerals. So we're moving a little bit away from sustainable development goals, but um, very relevant, I think. And if responsible mining is about maximising all the positive aspects and minimising the negative ones, then responsible sourcing schemes are important because they give the insurance that this is being done. How do you know that that mining company or any other company is actually doing all the right things, doing good, as Sarah just said, and or, or not? Is it all just greenwash and nice window dressing? And so in this talk, I'm going to go over some of the schemes and, uh, and the 
the issues that people are really interested in in the mining industry. And then I'm going to show how we're trying to connect some of our geology skills and processing expertise to responsible sourcing, looking at life cycle assessment and some outreach activities. So this is my list, my personal list of what I think a responsible mine needs to do. So you can run down that and you might agree with me or add some more or take some away. But I think often when people talk about responsible mining in the, the wider world, they're thinking really about the socioeconomic aspects. And I think from our technical point of view, coming from our world, it's really important. There's a lot of technical things in there too that we can contribute to. And of course, we're talking about mining, but that very much applies all the way through the mine life cycle, uh, right from the beginnings of exploration. So what about responsible sourcing schemes then? So here's the marks that I guess you'll know. There are some very famous responsible sourcing uh, schemes that we all know, that we all use. We regularly buy fair trade coffee and we might buy fair trade bananas and we might look when we're buying furniture as whether things have the forestry stewardship council mark. Um, but what about when you go to buy your mobile phone or you go to buy your car? That's enormously more complicated, isn't it? If you tried to find out whether all the components in your car were sourced from responsible mines, it would take about one lifetime, I suppose, to actually go and buy your car. And that's exactly what I think we see in the mining industry. If you look um, over on my right-hand side here, then I've listed some schemes which are very... Uh, well known or quite well known anyway things like the Kimberley process that everybody would talk about and these schemes here all relate if you see to to jewelry things to things like gold or diamonds where you can recognize the commodity when you have it so that's the same as coffee or bananas or wooden furniture when there's an easy connection between us as the consumer and the raw material then we're interested in responsible sourcing and we can make that connection and we're interested in the schemes and so when we go to buy jewellery people are interested in knowing where those things have come from and you get the feel-good factor don't you if you buy something that you think is doing good at the other end but let's come back to the car or the phone problem uh, sometimes I talk to students and I say right who would put this uh, responsible sourcing at the top of your list and they all say absolutely everybody says no because they want to know what the camera's like in the mobile phone and what the price is and all the other gadgets on it and that sits a long way ahead of responsible sourcing. So let's come from the consumer end and look at what the mining is industry is doing at the other end and I just put a couple of logos on this slide and the ICMM. I don't suppose any of normal consumer outside of this room would have even ever heard of the ICMM, but that's more about the overall image of the mining industry and that they thought that was hampering their business, I think, as to why they set up. So this is an organisation of about 25 of the world's largest, most major mining companies that run an organisation here in London that look at best practice and produce guidelines and toolkits that they hope that not only will their members use, but will go out and be used by other people through the industry. And their members are um, audited and certificated to global reporting initiative standards, and they hope to lead by best practice. And then the, for all the other mining companies in the world, I, the thing I would pick on is the equator principles, where the banks and people lending money wanted to be assured that they weren't lending on projects that were going to really damage their reputations and create problems. And so these equator principles, um, if you're trying to raise money to build a new mine or extend your mine, then you will need to comply by these. And there's actually quite a lot of work um, that's done by consultants from the UK going all around the world and advising companies on how they can apply with these, uh, comply with these standards. So I just put two logos up there, but of course there are more than that. And I think from the mining company side, the point here at the moment is there's loads of things going on. 
And this is a diagram actually which we've never published. It's done with our colleague Oliver Heydrich at Newcastle University, where he put the pillars of sustainability, so he put social environment and economic on the graph, and then we populated it with all the kind of schemes that we know in mining. So when you look at someone's website, you see all kinds of uh, good things that the company will say it's doing, and how on earth do you sort out what's what and whether that's a responsible source uh, for you to buy from or to deal with in whatever way it is as a stakeholder you're dealing with it. And so you've got all kinds of things here. There's specific reporting tools that companies use. There's the auditable management systems that are really important. Um, things like um, the health and safety, 18,001, like ISO 14,001 for environmental um, things and the management, uh, 9,001. And then that all comes together in these um, bigger schemes and there's a whole variety of them and lots of acronyms that I won't spend time or else we won't get to coffee going through. But I think at the moment that I would highlight a problem that if you're a consumer, there's no chance, is there? And what if you're a manufacturer? How do you know? Because there are more responsible sourcing schemes in the manufacturing industry, far more things than this. So if the EITI is operative, if someone says they're reporting to global compact standards, what does all that mean? And it would be really nice, wouldn't it, to have one mark for the mining industry that everybody complies with. And the people who are trying to do this, so there is an ambitious project to try and do this. And so this is the one, let me put this up and say, let's watch this and see what happens. It's called the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance. And they have on their panel state, different stakeholders, so NGOs as well as mining companies. There are representatives from Arcelor Metal and Anglo-American, but a much wider range of stakeholders than the ICMM, which is company only. Okay, so very different to that. And they have a scheme which is an auditable scheme that they, they've been testing. They've got a lot of feedback. There's a lot of negative feedback. It's going to be much too difficult for companies to apply with. But let's see what happens because they're planning to launch it next year in 2018. And wouldn't that be nice if mining, all mining companies just had one stamp like fair trade or something that could go on them. But of course, just one point to make before I skip on is that it doesn't matter uh, how many um, seals of approval you have, how many badges you've managed to apply to your company, we learn that things still go wrong. So people may be leaders of the ICMM, but they still have the San Marco tailings disaster, all the um, um, labour and employment problems and strikes in South Africa. And so actually it's quite difficult to be sure that everything will always go right. And I suppose in practice, of course, it won't. And it's those things that go wrong, of course, that reach the public. And that's what will make people hate mining companies, if you like, instead of uh, uh, being more positive, is the, the disasters. And so the things that really reach the consumer and produce consumer reaction are nothing to do with all these complicated compliance schemes. It's things like the uh, conflict minerals, blood diamonds and things. And this, this is one that I would highlight, the coltan, because the, um, the outrage that uh, people are, mine, are mining here and financing wars in eastern DRC actually is one thing that's led to legislation in terms of the famous Dodd-Frank Banking Act in the USA and the European Union now also has legislation. And if you want to know why people get so worked up about this and why they campaigned, if you go and um, listen to, there's a TED talk by a guy called Bandy and Booby. Just, he's a lawyer from DRC who lives in London. You just listen to him talk and that's what students did. And then they said, you can't, go and, you can't buy Apple computers in the University of Exeter anymore because those terrible people at Apple are using tantalum from these poor people here in their computers. It immediately made people go and campaign. And so besides this legislation to comply with that, there's now a paper trail. So the Colombo tantalite mineral is mined on all kinds of small scale mines in the region. It goes into locked boxes and then it has a um, trail that goes off with it so that companies can show that they're producing, that they're um, getting their minerals from a responsible source. Okay. And of course, people want to, we need to buy from Rwanda and DRC in these places because they need those mines for their sustain, sustainable development. 
So it's not a good answer to say, let's just not buy from there, let's go somewhere else. They want to sell you their minerals. And so this issue uh, started uh, the consumer pressure. And as I said, it was uh, Apple, the very high profile companies. That's what's happened. People go and campaign against those. They can't campaign against every company. They've got no idea who the mining companies are in Rwanda or DRC or anything, of course. That's far too far away from people. But they can pick on Apple, all right. And because of that, Apple is, was one of the leaders in actually trying to make sure that they could... Uh, know what their supply chains were all the way back through to the mines for these conflict minerals and for some other materials as well. And so they're leading in this area. But as someone mentioned yesterday, their most recent idea is to say to everybody, now, they, of course, they want us to buy phones, new phones all the time, don't they, to always rush for the latest phone. So they're saying to us as consumers, don't worry, guys, because we're going to recycle your phone and we're aiming to use all recycled material in the future with no date, because of course, as we've heard, as we know here, that's not so easy at all. Okay, but that's one business model. And the other one, this is the only telephone, a fair phone, you can buy from the company in Holland. I've got one in my handbag, anyone wants to see it, that actually comes with a picture of a miner on the screensaver that you get by default at the beginning. And their idea is different. <laughs> They're saying, we'll sell you this phone and you can upgrade things like cameras in it and keep it for longer, so you don't need to go and buy another and recycle on the Apple model, we'll try and get responsibly sourced materials into here and then you can keep it and upgrade it and it will last for longer. And just to say quickly, of course, it's not Coltan that's the big headline today, it's cobalt for batteries and the child labour in that. And that's a picture from Amnesty International. And here are some quotes. It's an, apparently, it's Elon Musk's worst nightmare. <laughs> And uh, you can see there's the work being done, and uh, Dylan McFarlane is here from PACT, and they're doing some work here. Actually, here we go, sponsored by Google. So it's the big companies that the really big, high-profile people have seen that they need to get involved in responsible sourcing. But what about us as geologists, then? And so this is what I want to do in the second part of the talk is to um, go through how you can see here's geology at the top of this slide and geology sits at the back of a lot of things that are in these responsible sourcing schemes so the energy use the carbon footprint the water use the environmental contamination possibilities if you're not careful the resource efficiency the health and safety what sort of minerals are you working and how this all relates to the geology of the deposit so it's not all about socioeconomics, although it's very important. There's a role for geologists and mineralogists too. And this is what we've been doing at uh, Camborne School of Mines, is we, we have projects that we heard about yesterday with a lot of other colleagues working on rare earths, but we've also been thinking about responsible sourcing. And we heard a lot about rare earths yesterday, but here is an article from the Daily Mail about uh, five or six years ago now. And... Uh, here are the villagers standing in front of the six-mile-wide toxic lake at Biotu, near Bayanobo in China, which is the world's biggest rare earth mine, and they were highlighting the terrible pollution problems there. And indeed, it's got a very nice um, HTTP link, Britain in China, True Cost, Britain's Clean Green Wind Power Experiment, Pollution Disastrous Scale. <laughs> And this is an anti-wind turbine article. That's really what it is, <laughs> if the Daily Mail will forgive me. And that's exact. So if you're going to have these environmental technologies, you better be sure that the materials you're getting are coming from a responsible source. There's no good messing up the planet for the people in China in order that we can feel good about having clean energy in the UK. And for rare earths, there are loads of different types of deposits, as Catherine was telling us a little bit about yesterday. And everything from weathered deposits, very soft things, mineral sands, through to very hard nepheline cyanite rocks, low-grade deposits at 500 parts per million, high-grade deposits at 60% rare earths. And so it's a really ideal area to look at the characteristics of those. And you don't need to go through the detail of this uh, table. It's from a paper that we've just written in Elements magazine. 
And I just want to see that you've got green. Green is good on this table. And so if you look at all the different kinds of deposits, and here's some examples here, they all have some characteristics that are likely to be very favourable for low energy and being nice and clean and not needing too many chemicals and not having too high a radioactivity. And then there are usually some negatives as well. So you pays your money and you take your choice, really. There isn't just one answer. There's no one perfect deposit. And here's an example of uh, how they can vary. So if you go through the stages of mining and processing, mining, minerals processing, um, dissolving up the minerals and separating rare earths, I put this on. So a conventional deposit like a carbonatite would have to be crushed and ground like most stuff that's mined and then maybe produced by flotation and then dissolved up. And Catherine showed us the iron adsorption deposits yesterday, which are nice because they don't need any of this stuff here. They can just go through and be dissolved. So they ought, by missing this, to actually be rather nice things to work. So we've been looking in some more detail at processing these, and this is Rob Pell's PhD. He's here today to talk to him, and he's been getting into the world of life cycle assessment, which is a whole other world of its own. But you can model any inputs, basically, that you like into your mining and processing system. You can define your boundaries where you want, and then you can look at issues such as energy use, global warming, potential and there are life cycle assessments that put in even all the socio-economic aspects as well. And we're looking at various rare earth deposits. And here's one of the examples of Rob's work. And what I'd like to highlight on here is, first of all, as we, we tend to go around the world saying that a huge amount of energy is used in crushing and grinding rock. 6% was Richard's figure yesterday, which I'm sure is quite right, and that is a huge amount of energy. But when you actually look at the factors that contribute to global warming on production of rare earths, the crushing and grinding is not the problem, it's the chemicals, it's the embodied energy in the chemicals that creates the problems. And so, whoops. And so here you can see these are comparing two carbonatite deposits, and they do different processes. One does um, flotation um, upgrade, and one doesn't bother, and it just goes straight to dissolution. And actually, it swings and roundabouts, and just see these lines are more or less the same. It all comes out the same here. So it doesn't matter which way you go with this deposit. They're going to use about the same amount of energy overall in their production. But you can use this life cycle approach to compare different sorts of deposits, to go into one deposit in great detail, to look at the actual processing in detail. And that means that, that you can really work with the companies so that they can produce the most efficient route to the um, production and processing of their rare earth mine. And this is the kind of thing that manufacturers along the supply chain are looking for. So they will do life cycle assessments over all of products, and they need to know where their things are coming from, and they obviously want the most environmentally friendly, low energy, lowest global warming potential sources for their um, deposits. And there's not very much been done in the rare earth space, so this is now um, an exciting thing to do. It may be exciting for manufacturers, but is it exciting for members of the public? And I think I'd have to say probably no, because they get excited by things like coltan and child labour in cobalt. So alongside SOS Rare, we're doing some outreach, and we just want to talk to people about the idea, really, that there are deposits and the stuff for your smartphones and your... Um, electric vehicles and things have to come out of the ground and that there's all kinds of different deposits and we need to work on finding the best ones and the best ways to mine them. So this is a, a project that we're, we're just uh, finishing now, ready for you to go and play a card game to compare rare earth deposits. So you may recognise the style of this as being the top trumps style of game and you can go and here's mountain pass I've done it for which is on that life cycle assessment so that's a nice big deposit wonderfully accessible it's in California not so radioactive nice environmental score um, it, well it's just it it could produce it's not producing it at the moment it's gone bust at the moment 
very politically stable country, but doesn't have some of the heavier rare earths that you need for magnets and things, the rarest rare earths. And so by this way, we're hoping that we can go into um, schools and um, also um, look at, we found it works really well with students and things to actually talk about these issues. And I can see that time's pressing, so I won't do that next slide. I'll just come straight to the um, summary here. So in summary, then, we, we need to mine, but doing it the right way is really important. But responsible sourcing, having given that talk, I'd have to say, is not the main issue. I think it's absolutely the bottom line and people still getting themselves into production and keeping in production, apart from when you get to these really headline issues, such as conflict minerals. But... We can use in-depth analysis techniques such as life cycle assessment to inform future approaches. And that's really important in connecting with manufacturers, but not so much, I would say, with the public. And for that, we need to find some different mechanisms. But there's loads of opportunities for us as geologists and mineralogists to get involved in the responsible sourcing agenda. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our first speaker is Gavin Hilson, who is the Chair of Sustainability and Business at the University of Surrey. Gavin. Okay. Um, great to be here. I, I, um, um, I've been carrying out research on the, the environmental and social impacts of uh, artisanal small-scale mining, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa for nearly... Um, 20 years, and over that over that period of time, the narrative hasn't really changed, but it's sort of changing now. Um, it's not all about environmental impacts, and we uh, we finally recognize that there's a story behind these environmental impacts and these social impacts that we we constantly hear about in in the media and um, on the internet. And over this time, my research has. Um, Changed in focus slightly. It, it seeks to to um, to create a bigger space and policy for artisanal and small scale mining, or ASM. Um, and I'll discuss momentarily how I go about doing this. Here's the details of a couple papers that no one's going to read but my dad. But anyway, um, as well as building a case for formalization, and and that's the ground I intend to cover today. Um, building a case for formalization, based largely on the overlooked social impacts, the positive impacts of artisanal and small-scale mining in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, who am I? This, this isn't about sharing my CV with you, but um, I, I mentioned I've been carrying out research on artisanal and small-scale mining for about 20 years. Um, I'm on uh, the board of uh, the Diamond Development Initiative, which is an, uh, an NGO that started up in 2006 uh, to, to look at um, uh, issues surrounding conflict diamonds. I uh, try to spend three months a year on the ground in a number of countries listed there, and I've 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 done I've done a lot of work for a number of organizations, and all of these experiences have sort of informed um, my position on artisanal and small scale mining. It's it's one thing doing the research and talking to the actors on the ground, but you need to be cognizant of what's going on in that policy space. So the organization to talk today quickly. Um, First of all, about building the case for formalization. Why should we pay more attention to formalizing this sector? And then quickly talking about the barriers to formalization. I've identified a number of barriers, um, a love for large-scale mining. I mean, it's no secret. It's always the elephant in the room. We're dealing with rent-seeking governments in sub-Saharan Africa, and large-scale mining is easy cash for these governments. Uh, the fact that there's no land, the licensing fees are, are exorbitant and very, very bureaucratic, the process of getting a license. And generally speaking, people don't like ASM. It's not a particularly sexy topic. No one really likes it. And then I'm going to get into the next steps. People always ask me, you know, well, what's the, ne what's the next step, Gavin? You know, I'm an academic. I'm great at telling people what's wrong, you know, but I'm not really good at coming up with ideas on how to improve things. I'm going to try to do that today. <clears throat> Building the case first. This is a neglected sector of, of industry, okay? a neglected economic sector. Um, and it's very, very bizarre. When you, when you study this sector, it's really, really bizarre to, to 
as to why this is happening, because it's an unrivaled employment engine. And when we're talking about sub-Saharan Africa, we're talking about loads of unemployment, loads of youth unemployment. And this sector, I'm not saying everyone should become a minor, but it's engaging youth. It's providing us with um, uh, time to think more creatively about how to uh, generate employment in that poor area of the world. Okay. Um, most of this, most of, um, here are the numbers, uh, most of the, the small-scale mining activity in sub-Saharan Africa, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute, is informal. So we're talking about unlicensed um, operators, okay, people who are not legal. Okay? And I don't know where they get these numbers from. Uh, no one's ever done a census on artisanal and small-scale mining. Some, every 10 years, someone comes up with a number. But the bottom line is these are very, very conservative estimates but you get an idea as to how many people are employed in this sector. You know, when we're talking about individual countries like Tanzania and Ghana, we're talking about a quarter, a third of that population dependent upon the sector in, in some way or another, either, as, uh, either being employed directly or in the jobs that, um, in, in the various industries and economic activities the sector spawns. <clears throat> Most of these people, are, um, and a lot of people contest this, but for the most part, we're talking about um, a sector that's poverty driven. People are, are in this sector because there's no other jobs. There's, there's, there's very few other economic opportunities in, in the countries we're talking about. Um, and I've, I've seen loads of people over the years. I've seen people with university degrees working as small scale miners. I've seen people who um, have branched out from farming I've seen people who've worked in the public sector, who have worked in the mining sector that have some kind of technical training. It's a really eclectic group of people we're talking about. And when you see those images on the website, there's no way you can actually guess where these people have come from unless you communicate with them. Okay? And that seems to be the problem. <clears throat> if we break it down, and this is a very simplified sort of um, uh, look of a small scale mining community, um, say in Ghana or West Africa, we're dealing with people who have um, uh, various skills, we're dealing with unskilled labor, we're dealing with some markets. Um, if you're into you know, drugs and alcohol, you can get some good quality stuff there. I'm not saying that I've sampled it, but you know, anyway. Um, lots of stuff going on there. These are, these are you know, bustling communities, lots of economic activity going on there. All right? <clears throat> it sustains subsistence farming. All right? In addition to direct employment, indirect employment, we're talking about um, a sector of industry that sustains subsistence farming. And that's very, very significant because we're talking about a development agenda in sub-Saharan Africa that seems to think everyone is a farmer in Africa and everyone wants to be a farmer. We know very, uh, for those of you who's, who know a thing or two about rural development in sub-Saharan Africa, we know it's very, very difficult to be a farmer. Sometimes it really sucks to be a farmer because your, your fertilizers are no longer subsidized by the state, the, um, the support services have been dismantled under structural adjustment. So, you're being assisted as a farmer, but it's very, very difficult to generate um, crops for market, particularly when you're competing with those large multinationals that, are, that control that agricultural space. <clears throat> a few more points on that issue. Um, you know, the data vary, but you often see numbers like this, 80 to 90 percent of Africans employed in agriculture. Um, I would say 80 to 90 percent of Africans engage in agriculture. They don't necessarily depend on it as a, as a primary income source. Um, and, you know, most of these schemes we're talking about, whether it's the World Bank, whether it's the bilateral, um, it's, it's generally focused on, on supporting agriculture, which is important, but not necessarily as, a, as an income earning activity. Um, and we see that ASM generates earnings that facilitates the purchase of farm inputs. We know we see this sort of dovetailing of the two sectors. When you're not mining, you're farming. When you're not farming, you're mining. You see the labor sort of go back and forth. You see the capital flow back and forth. And there's been a lot of studies conducted over the past 10 to 15 years that have, that have confirmed this in, in the likes of Mali through to Tanzania. <clears throat> so the confusing thing is that ASM is the most important rural non-farm activity in sub-Saharan Africa, but it's neglected, okay? Well, I mentioned that most of this activity is informal, all right? We, we see time and time again, or from country to country, that this sector is generally confined to an informal space. And I would say over 99% of ASM activities in that region are unlicensed, okay? They're, 
these are the, we, we spoke about ethical mineral schemes uh, in the previous presentation. These are excellent schemes that could potentially empower these people if they had a license, okay? But these people are generally excluded from these schemes because they don't have a license. Why is this the case? Why are they informal? The first reason is people don't like ASM, okay? The donors don't like ASM. The NGOs don't like ASM. The sustainable development goals don't like ASM. I was consulted when, when um, uh, this was put together. You can download this online. <clears throat> I had several conversations with the, the lead author. He didn't mention me in the report, which I'm a bit furious about. But um, They put this together and then decided that I was stressing to the, the individual that it's very, very important that you include ASM in this atlas, okay? that we're not just talking about large-scale mining. We're talking about artisanal and small-scale mining, which employs many more people. Many more people in places like Sub-Saharan Africa depend on this industry for their livelihoods. Um, and if you turn to, I think it's page 47 or something, in type 2 font, you read this, okay? And basically, it says that the, the, the document says, that, oh, don't, you know, ASM, we're not talking about ASM here, we're talking about LSM. We don't want to deal with ASM, okay? And this is interesting because we, we encountered this problem with the Millennium Development Goals, okay? Uh, Jeffrey Sachs set up a Millennium Village in uh, a village called uh, Bonsasso in Ghana, and he tried to make everyone um, a farmer in that village when they'd been mining gold for 300 years. It led to them having to relocate the Millennium Village to northern Ghana where there was no minerals. So we've encountered this problem time and time again. ASM is always the elephant in the room. And in most places in sub-Saharan Africa where people are farming, they have some connection to small-scale mining. The poverty reduction strategy papers, which are sort of the, the, um, the main documents that guide development <clears throat> in developing countries and what you've got to produce in order to get a loan from the World Bank, um, most of them don't mention artisanal and small-scale mining. They mostly mention large-scale activity when they focus on mining. And the New Economic Partnership for African Development, which is sort of a, a uh, you know, sort of a guiding policy for the region, doesn't mention ASM at all. It only mentions farming and other types of trades. So the overarching policy machinery in this part of the world is, is lacking as far as content goes when it comes to ASM. Um, licensing fees. It's very, very difficult to get a license as a small-scale miner. Um, and there's very little land available because it's been all given out to large-scale mining companies and mineral exploration companies. So on the one hand, these, these governments and these donors and, and these NGO people are going to conferences saying that artisanal and small-scale mining is a poverty-driven industry. But they're charging people $10,000 to get a license. So the two don't really add up, okay? It's very, very difficult to get a license. Several examples, even though over time, it's been, met, it's been mentioned time and time again over the past 10 to 15 years um, that, look, you know, this sector, we need to simplify the, reg uh, the regulations, we need to simplify the process, we need to reduce costs. We, we, we shouldn't be making cost and bureaucracy an issue if we're talking about poverty-driven people. But for some reason, um, we continue to charge exorbitant fees for, for licenses. Places like Liberia, if you want to move up from the Class C to the Class B license, you got to pay 10 grand, and the key here is that you can't, um, you can't use machinery if you have a class, class, um, uh, class B license. If you want to make that transition, you, you, need, to, you need to pay that money. In Ghana, um, you know, I mentioned this as part of my PhD work uh, about 15, 20 years ago. I mentioned how the, the costs were exorbitant. This was a major finding from my PhD that you're, you're creating informality. You know, you're preventing these people from making this transition to the formal sector. And I mentioned it then, and we're still talking about it now. The costs of, of license, the licensing fees and all the permitting fees have, have actually increased. And here's a good example. I mean, this is, a, this is someone I, 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 I met a few years ago. I know him very well. And he was talking about what he had to do to get a license. Okay? And this guy has quite a bit of money. He has a university degree. So if we're talking about poverty-driven people, um, illiterate people, imagine what they have to go through if they want to get a license. Um, loads of fees, thousands and thousands of dollars, having to go to the capital city. Many of these people haven't been to the capital cities before to get everything signed. 
And he said that this is where the, the process officially starts. And what he means by that is when you confine a sector to an informal space, all these nasty characters emerge and control that space. So in order to sort of kickstart the process, he had to bribe chiefs, he had to pay landowners, people who, according to the law, he doesn't have to pay, but he, he needs to get access to that land. And the, and the government officials will not interact with him until he's actually secured that parcel of land. So there's all these sort of fees that he has to pay in the informal economy before he can even make that, that kickstart the process to get a license. I talked about land. Go to Flexi Cadaster online. You can check out these maps. You know, various countries like, like DRC, Zambia, they're all concessioned out. I mean, um, Tanzania, Uganda, the entire country is under, under the control of, of large-scale, predominantly foreign large-scale mineral exploration companies and mining companies. This is Zambia. Um, I, I just, I, you know, here, here's some data here. You know, Ghana, we're talking about 25% of the country is, is under concession to large-scale mining companies. Tanzania, huge concessions. Liberia, huge areas uh, under the control of, of foreign multinationals. The DR Congo, loads of permits covering massive areas of land. I, I'm, I'm p putting together a paper right now and uh, um, this, is the, this is the data for Ghana. Um, you know, you're, you're talking about 25% of the, of the country currently under concession to large-scale um, mining companies and mineral exploration companies. So if you, if you want to do this, if you want to get a license, where are you going to mine? It's very, very difficult. And the big issue here is that you give, a, you give a company a huge plot of land, and there's a lot of deposits on, on, on that plot of land, whether they're alluvial deposits, fracture zones, near surface hard rock deposits that the mining company isn't interested in, but you as a small scale miner are interested in, but cannot access because it's been demarcated to the big mining company. So geology is a very, very important issue. We mentioned it in the previous presentation. It's very, very important. <clears throat> um, there's a large scale mining bias. Um, it's, it's no secret that we're again dealing with rent seeking governments and they love large scale mining because it's easy cash. Okay? Um, you're talking about licensing fees, you're talking about royalties, you're talking about rents, you're talking about exploration taxes. You don't have to get off your seat to get this money. It's easy, easy cash. And just go through the, um, the EITI reports, they're online, and it shows you how much money these governments are getting in the form of, of, of permit fees, royalties, all kinds of taxes by not even getting off their seats. Okay? This is Zambia. Um, this is uh, these are some examples from Ghana, and I can share the presentation with you afterwards. Um, here's, you know, Burkina Faso, which is basically a desert. You know, they don't, they don't have to get off their seats and look at how much money they're getting in the form of various taxes and fees. You can go online, check the EITI reports. In many cases, they're directly on the website how much money these, 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 these countries are receiving from large-scale mining. You know, it's, it's very, very easy to get this cash. So if you're having, an, if you're having a discussion with with some of these countries, oh, you know, if you do this, you formalize these activities, you, you set this up, you set this up, you set this up, in a year's time you can get this amount of money. You know, you can't have that conversation with governments, and I've learned this painfully over the past 10 to 15 years. It, you know, what's in it for them right now? And with large-scale mining, you get the money right now. <clears throat> so next steps, and this is the difficult part, this is the last part of my presentation. I'm always asked, what can we do? And I thought about this, and having, you know, had a lot of interaction with NGOs, uh, various donors, the private sector um, over the past 10 to 15 years, uh, it's got me thinking about, about how we proceed, okay? How do we, how do we uh, increase the space in policy for artisanal and small-scale mining? Um, the good thing is that there's a lot of donor interest. And 15 years ago, you didn't see these, these donors on board, you know, DFID, um, Danita, a whole bunch of different donors, in addition to the, in, in addition to the multilaterals, you know, the various departments of the UN producing some, or, or funding some very, very comprehensive programs, much more so than 15, 20 years ago. These NGOs, particularly GIZ, um, Australia, and the, the Australian government coming up with some very, very comprehensive schemes. Um, so the thinking is there, but because the sector's been neglected for so long, um, it's sort of a case of, of, well, how do we proceed, okay? We, we want to do something, but we've ignored it, and we don't know what's going on. How do we proceed? So the good thing is that we have the donors on board, all right? 
Um, but the problem is that you're dealing with a donor policy machinery that was designed without ASM in mind. So we have to work around it. How do we do this? Well, we use language that resonates in the space. You know, things like resilience, things like climate change, building ASM into these existing programs and, and uh, big sort of uh, donor spaces. The good thing is that the Africa Mining Vision, which is um, sort of the, the guiding policy for, for African mining development, uh, identifies uh, artisanal mining, uh, covers it quite a bit, and one of, its, one of its goals is boosting artisanal and small-scale mining, whatever that means. But the fact is it mentions it, so which is great. Okay, so we have something to rally around. Couple things, um, and this is, this is drawing heavily on work I'm doing now in Zambia, Ghana, and Sierra Leone. Um, given who we're dealing with, these governments, um, I, I think if we, if we promote this taxation issue, um, we're going to get somewhere. If we build our case around formaliza formalization and say that, you know, if we formalize this sector, you can capture boatloads of money in the form of tax. Now, there's two sides to this. One, the governments are definitely going to eventually come on board, maybe not necessarily in the beginning because it will take some time to formalize, uh, because there's money involved. Um, on the other side of the equation, miners are interested in being taxed. A big argument has been that miners are avoiding tax by operating in the informal economy, that they don't want to get licensed because they, they don't want to pay tax. That is not necessarily the case. Many miners I've communicated with have said that we want a license because we're already paying tax in the informal economy. We have to bribe the chiefs, so you've got to bribe the landlords. If we were formalized and we paid this license fee and gave the government X amount from our gold, we'd probably be paying less. Moreover, we'd have access to those services that all businesses have access to, all legitimate businesses have access to, those financial services, those technological services. You can't go into a bank and get a loan and say, you know, hey man, I'm, I'm illegal, can you give me some cash? No one's going to give you money, right? But if you have a license and you're a legitimate business, then you're in a position to probably get some support. Um, <clears throat> second point is, and not to sort of um, steal Dan's thunder here, but this development mineral space has really got me thinking. Um, with gold and precious minerals, there's, there's a lot of, there are a lot of ifs and this has to happen, okay, in order for this to happen. So if you get the gold and you get it formalized, the government has to, you know, earmark a percentage for this, this, and this. With development minerals, the case is right there. You're dealing with, with aggregates, you're dealing with construction minerals, the markets are there. So the justification for formalizing is right there in front of your face, okay? We need to formalize this sector because there's a demand for construction minerals here. We need to formalize this sector because there's a market here. So it's got me thinking a bit more dynamically because I used to just think about the precious minerals, the space I work in, but I think, you know, if we're talking about low-hanging fruit and making an immediate impact, this is where we start. And that's all I have to say. Thanks. I'm sure there's plenty more that you can say. <laughs> is there uh, a quick question? Yes, Francis. There is, but um, I'm, I'm dead against this uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, very few companies are, are willing to relinquish portions of their land. And obviously, looking at it from the point of view of a company, why should they? I mean, they secure that land for 30 years. They've determined that X amount of the concession is viable for 10 years, and maybe they'll start exploring on another part of the concession. <clears throat> Secondly, when we're dealing with a multinational corporation, we're dealing with different levels of management. You can probably have that conversation with the managers on the ground, but how do you have that conversation with people in Toronto, in London, the, the investors? You know, hey, we're going to relinquish some land. It's going to yield. It's going to yield returns, or it's going to increase our shareholder value. You can't have that conversation. Thirdly, um, when we're dealing with the prices of minerals, I can give you several examples. There were several cases in West Africa where portions of of, of the lease were, were sort of informally relinquished. You can mine there, don't worry. We won't, you know, we won't bother you. But when the price of gold went up or when the price of diamonds went up, it changed the dynamic entirely. And finally, mining companies don't want to be responsible for these people. So you know, if there's an accident, if, there's, if it's not you know, regulated properly, then they're responsible for what happens on their lease. So you know, I say that the new, new reformers in Africa, 
uh, the Mozambiques, the Malawis. Let's sort this out from the beginning. You know, let's let's put aside these areas for small scale mining because even if your your priority is large scale mine development, this helps you in the long run achieve that goal. Okay. Thank you. It, did, oh, there's another. Exactly okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Cheers. Right. Returning to water, Julia, who is a senior consultant at WSP Water Services in Shrewsbury, is going to talk to us. Julia. Hello, um, and thank you for coming today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the importance of water in project development and how you might want to uh, think about that risk and then reduce it. So I've been working in the water industry for about 10 years and in mining for about six. So um, when I think about water and mining, I often think about too much water. So things like trying to dewater a mine so you can actually get some minerals out. And also too little. So you really need a water supply um, to actually mine. And where's that going to come from? So global water demand and quality. Um, water demand is increasing. There's been a UNESCO report recently where, which stated that by 2030, if we kept on managing our water resources as we have been, there would be a global deficit in water supply of about 40%. This is a map of um, the risk of water quality um, and how it might be degraded. So in the top is the baseline period. Um, so red is when it's very high risk of degradation of quality and green is it's low risk. And uh, Cesiro have predicted by 2050 that that risk is just going to increase across most continents. So the potential for a degradation in water quality is going to increase. So water in mining. So uh, a mine needs water and um, generally I'm not sure you can really get a good feel on how much uh, the mining industry uses. Um, globally, and this is partly because things like artisanal mining might not be counted in that, but they are still using water. Um, one estimate that I read recently was about 2% of the global supply was being used for mining, and that's in comparison with, say, about 40% for agriculture. So it's not always the biggest user, and that's quite important. Um, the amount of water you need for your mine is really dependent on the size of your mine. So a big mine is going to need a lot of water, it's pretty obvious. But also the type of mineral you're trying to mine, so gold and copper, the processes you need to um, get that mineral out is a lot more water intensive than something like coal. So where and how is water used in mining? Um, typically you'll be looking at a freshwater supply and then also an element of reusing water within your cycle. So you'll be trying to take water that you've already used and instead of discharging it, you want to reuse it within your process. So you need water for moving material about. So you, water is used to move rock and tailings around your mine. You need it for the process in itself. Um, you need to uh, separate material by physical processes like flotation, but also within things like chemical processes. You need things like waste uh, washing, so washing vehicles, and, and dust suppression, which is really important. Um, and the other area is, of course, possible water. So I'm sure most of you here have seen all of these risks for businesses, risks for mining. Um, you probably all know a lot more about it than I do, because I only really look at the water ones. Um, and I think the key one is they're often repeated year on year. Um, they'll be in a different order and there'll be a slightly different take on what those risks might be. So in 2016, there was access to energy and water as an example. But in 2012, um, it was interruptions to supply rather than 
the access itself. And I think it's really important to remember in these mining risks, uh, these risks to the business, that um, water might not be stated as an exact risk, but it's often involved in other risk areas. So things like the social license to operate. Um, if you're competing with a water supply that local users are already using, that's risking your social license. Um, also, you need water to operate your plant. So if you're looking at optimization and um, cash use and efficiencies within your um, financials, you need to consider the elements of the um, the elements of your project that you need you can make more efficient, and water is one of those. So the mining companies themselves, as you already are well aware, they have sustainability strategies, and they are identifying water as key areas to look at. Um, all the different uh, mining companies all have different strategies. It's um, you know, they'll be looking at different things in slightly different ways. I quite like this one, which is from Goldcorp, um, which is the influence of business along the bottom. So low impact down in the corner and critical impact up towards this end. And then it's also the importance to stakeholders along the y-axis. So again, low importance and then up to critical importance. And you've got a real range of things like supply chain management, um, research and development down the bottom. But up at the higher end, you've got things like water management. It's one of the key critical areas that they've identified. So from this, they've said, OK, well, we need to understand what that means to our business. So they've looked at water stewardship steps, like water audits, um, site-wide water balances. And this is very much a site um, level initially. So trying to understand what each of their sites is looking at. And then taking that information, and they have a long-term uh, strategy now, which is called H20, that's using this baseline information that's site-based. And it's trying to reduce their total water consumption. Um, and they want to use as close to zero input of fresh water as possible. So to do this, they're looking to reduce um, their water by increasing their recycling rate, rates of water within their mine by up to 80%, which is pretty high. So I'm just going to go through a few um, specific project examples. I think we've done a lot of policy this morning, which is really interesting. Um, but these are just a few examples of projects where there has been a key water issue. Um, and kind of the methodology and the outcome um, that we worked through. So this is a project that's in development in Eastern Europe. It's a gold copper mine. Um, and it's, so it will need quite a high water intake for the process. Surface water in this area is the key water resource. And there's also a large agricultural population already. So there's a large body of users. Um, so what we were, um, the client here, had already identified water as a really key area of their PFS. They were quite concerned about it, and it became a very um, focused area of the environmental and social impact assessment as well. So what we tried to do initially was map out all of the users within the um, water resources and management uh, state for the baseline conditions. So trying to understand who was using the water and how much they were using. Particularly important for the um, surface water because the demand on the surface water was a lot higher in summer when actually you don't get much um, rainfall in this area. It's a very Mediterranean climate and um, it was drier and there was a lot of high demand. And one of the outcomes of this initial kind of overview of trying to understand the water here was that the current supply, although it was quite good, picture underneath is actually um, one of the local reservoirs. It was probably adequate just about for the local population as it was, but at times it was really under quite a lot of stress just to produce the water that the communities and agriculture needed in this area. 
So the strategy for this project was to basically try to conserve water within the mine process itself. So reuse water from tailings as much as possible, uh, reuse all surface water across the site, and to reduce the um, discharges as close to zero as possible. It was also to engage the local water institutions and the community from very early in the project. It needed to be a collaborative approach here because there were so many users and it was quite a complicated water environment already. And finally, um, the mine needed to look for a water resource that no one else was using to reduce that competition on the water resources in this area. So there were two main options for this project really. Um, there was a deep groundwater option and then there was a secondary reservoir that required a new pipeline or culvert infrastructure to be built in order to, for it to be linked from the reservoir, which is kind of a couple of kilometers away, um, to the mining site project. Uh, these two options were taken in tandem during the exploration and uh, planning stages because it was felt that there wasn't enough information at a lot of stages and it was such a critical area for the mine that it didn't, they didn't want it to hold up permitting um, during the process. So this is us drilling a pilot well for the gra potential groundwater supply. Um, in this area, there are a lot of agricultural users, as I've already said, and they have quite a lot of small, uh, shallow wells, which are about 10 metres. So you can't look at groundwater near the surface here. You need to go much deeper. So we drilled this well to about 250 metres. And we tested it. So this is us trying to pump the well, the black line, and that is the water level in the well. So as you pump, the water level in the well decreases. The blue line is a monitoring well that was drilled nearby. So the blue one was quite a deep one, so it was looking at whether it, the pumping of the groundwater well was impacting at the deep area of the aquifer. And we also looked at a monitoring well close to where the current users were, so the shallow wells that the farmers were using. And as you can see, as we started pumping, the water level in the pumping well dropped significantly, and the water level in the deep well also dropped. But what was great about this one was that we were definitely right about the fact that there wasn't a connection between the shallow aquifer and the deeper aquifer because there was very little change in the um, shallow monitoring well. So although, unfortunately, we didn't get the yield we really needed for the mine um, out of this pilot hole, um, it did prove that we could still look, consider groundwater deep groundwater as an option because it wouldn't be impacting on those shallow users. Um, so another example of where water has been a key issue. This is a project in West Africa and sediment is a particular problem for aquatic ecology here. Um, on the right hand side, this is what would naturally happen after heavy rainfall in that area. Topsoil is um, eroded and it gives the rivers and streams in that area a kind of grey, browny colouring. And this is natural, it's a humic topsoil. If you disturb the soil in this area, it's, it's very friable and it leads to really exaggerated um, erosion and what you get is there's iron clays in the subsoil underneath the topsoil and this turns the rivers and streams this red colour in heavy rain so you, you want to try and avoid that if you're mining and you're exploring you don't want to be causing events which one might harm the aquatic ecology but two it also potentially might um, worry local communities so we set up sediment monitoring in all the usual ways, so baseline monitoring, um, monitoring during storm events, so automatic monitoring. But the other key um, area that we looked at here 
was actually community monitors. So we asked, um, we trained up local villagers to um, do monitoring within at the points where they were regularly going to uh, access water in their villages. So we asked them to go twice a day and record the colour in the river and um, also turbidity. And what we were able to find was that at one point there was a complaint about um, a red, red event, which is normally down to, say, mining activities or agricultural or artisanal mining in this area as well. Um, and actually, we were able to go out to, the mine was able to go out to the village and discuss with them what they'd seen and look at the data they'd collected themselves. And in this case, it was actually um, in an unimpacted catchment. So we were monitoring both unimpacted and disturbed catchments. And we said, and we were able to show them using both our data and the data the community had collected that this event was from a natural landslip that was just caused by extremely heavy rain rather than any mining activities or agricultural activities. So I think here it's important to remember that community engagement with things like the water issues, it can help to um, pr provide trust and transparency between the community and the companies. Uh, I think this has been mentioned quite a bit already this morning. Um, we can, it's no longer acceptable to pollute water. And there are a lot of financial regulations, such as equator principles, IFC standards, and national regulations to help manage ARD and metal leaching in the mining companies and mineral environment. So this is a mine in Peru. It's up in the Andes, and it straddles two catchments. Um, it's got a particularly sensitive catchment, which drains down into the Amazon basin. And it's already an operating mine. And very early on, they, pre they started to engage in an acid rock drainage investigation. So they were looking at, um, basically, they, they set up on tests, uh, on-site tests, large scale, where they put in a lot of rock into giant barrels on site, allowed the climate to rinse them through. And you look at um, the leachate that's produced, and you're able to link this with the geology models um, and the mine plan, and it helps with operational decisions. Um, this is pretty well known. I think a lot of places do this. Um, this is the pit shell for this particular mine. Um, the red is basically the high-risk material, the material that's going to produce an acid response metal leaching. This particular mine is uh, a porphyry deposit, so it's got quite a lot of sulfides in there. It's quite high-risk, generally, um, that there is a lot of this sulfidic material that can produce the acid drainage. Um, and it's, they were able to use this information collectively along with water balance information to basically help them understand their treatment requirements through operations. And it included a treatment process so that they could reuse the water. Because a lot of the time, if you've got quite high sulfate loads and things like that, you might not be able to reuse your water for process. Um, because the solute load is too high. And currently, they're also looking at their closure options. So we've talked a lot about legacy this morning already. Um, and they're trying to uh, look at what options they can include. And um, they've been planning this for quite some time, obviously. But I think it's really important to remember to continually update your closure plans because you get new technologies and there's new ways of thinking. And this one is looking at whether you can backfill some of the pit with tailings, which is, helps to cover up your potential high-risk material. And it's an ongoing study, so there isn't actually a result yet. <laughs> um, but finally, a few th th thoughts. Uh, global water demand is increasing and the quality is decreasing. I think everyone needs to think of water as a resource, but mining companies in particular you need to think of it not as a re resource in the same way as a mineral resource. Um, 
we have to use this water resources sustainably. It's pretty vital because there are social, economic and production risks associated. Um, one easy win is just to look at water resources that other users aren't able to access. So mining companies are good at drilling. Let's drill deep for water. Um, and also, it's early engagement with regulators, with local water institutions and the community. Often, communities are really aware of their water challenges and they want to talk about them. And also, you need to proactively manage your water quality prior to any incidents, and that includes planning for your closure, so making sure that you've got a good, robust plan in place. And that's it. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Is there a question? Yes. Just, um, yeah, really interesting talk. I mean, obviously, water is a huge issue. I wonder with this, you know, looking at deep, deep aquifers, do you regularly uh, monitor the age of the water? Yeah, yes. I mean, that's a big issue of depleting uh, old yeah, it is. And you need to look carefully at whether they're being refreshed enough yeah. that you can actually take out water to the degree. Um, and it's also whether you can use that water, because if it's a deep aquifer, it might it can be really quite saline. Um, which And they're the kind of problems that you see in the Middle East. OK. Thank you very much. Can I just invite now... Catherine, Natalia, Daniel and Sarah to join me on the platform for this panel-led discussion. You have already heard from them, but also Dylan McFarlane, who you are yet to hear from and who will introduce himself uh, when he gets around to being able to speak. Trying to draw together all that we've heard this morning under the discussion topic of how can we share benefits and risks more fairly? Can the resources needed for global development be sourced in an environmentally and socially acceptable way? Now, to help us with this, Catherine is going to share with you some of her impressions and common themes and then we'll have a talk. And then there's an opportunity for you to engage in this conversation. So, Catherine. Thanks, Edmund. So I'm uh, taking off the critical raw materials hat I had on yesterday and putting on my hat of a deputy director for BGS Global, which is our overseas development arm. And Edmund has asked me to be very brief. So I'm going to reflect pretty briefly on what we've heard, a really fascinating set of talks this morning and I think they really brought out the importance of mining in terms of international development and particularly the links to the sustainable development goals. I think we saw nearly every sustainable development goal mentioned in talks this morning and it is something that's so key that mining really does have an impact across that whole range of goals. So something that I thought was really interesting that came out uh, from Natalia and others was the focus on international businesses, large-scale mining, often metal mining, like Daniel said, and how that can be dealt with perhaps at almost international level approaches, like the ones that Francis talked about for responsible sourcing, how there can be a big focus on development through taxes and government revenues, as we heard from Gavin. And so a lot of these things can be addressed at a very large national to international scale. And in the same way, a lot of the impacts, perhaps environmental, for example, might also be addressed at large scale through things like life cycle assessments. Uh, but much of that doesn't involve the communities on the ground. And yet everybody spoke about the importance of involving the communities on the ground and how that community dialogue is perhaps the most important thing if you really want to have responsible mining that is important for international development. And Gavin used a phrase that I think is really important here. He talked about the elephants in the room. And I got the impression from these talks that there's a lot of elephants in the room when it comes to 
mining and international development, and I heard about artisanal and small-scale mining as still being an elephant in the room, because it needs to be formalized so that it really can contribute to economies and to good, sustainable lives and livelihoods. I heard mention of construction and development minerals and how there's not so much focus on those, and yet, as Daniel said, they're such important parts of contributors to economies. Uh, Sarah, in particular, talked about a lot of the social impacts and some of the ones we might not always think about, but the impacts of having this addition of, from men to quite small communities. And then, of course, the last talk, we heard about water, and perhaps that's one of the biggest issues that's going to be faced across the next few decades. So that's my summary of my reflections. Thank you very much indeed. Who would like to lead off, Daniel? question. <laughs> 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 okay, so I, have, um, I think I have three observations related to the questions that, that were raised. The first is, um, the second part of the question I think was, um, what are the resources needed for social development? I think criticality of, of minerals depends on your perspective, right? And um, I think all of the d discussions that we have around what are the minerals needed for the future tends to be around what are the minerals needed for the future or from the developed world perspective. All of the critical minerals defined by the EU are from the perspective of what Europe needs. The criticality, if you're in uh, the developing world, is totally different. The minerals that you might need for your own development are, are, the, are different minerals. Um, and that kind of leads me to the second part around benefit sharing and risks. Perspective is also important in, in that area. Um, people experiencing risk um, think about risk very differently to the people that are um, contributing risk. So in the discussions we had this morning, there was a, a few times in which I was thinking, well, if it was from the perspective of um, a, a mining community, would risk be considered quite differently? Um, automation, Sarah mentioned automation this morning, and it will, automation will reduce the number of on-site job roles and will change the way in which communities interact with mining. But is that necessarily a feasible thing from the perspective of a developing world country? Um, the, what is the value proposition for automation in Africa? Is it actually that feasible that we're going to convince African governments to automate mines that are providing, you know, the only real impact is to the workforce and to local procurement, etc. Um, so thinking about risk, um, we, need to, we need to have that kind of um, multi-perspective approach. The final um, observation I'd make is there is an interplay between risk. So there is... I, I did some work um, with Rachel Davis at the Harvard Kennedy School on the costs of uh, conflict in mining. And the research that we did, we looked at 50-odd conflicts, I think, and environmental risks were the things that were driving um, local conflicts. And that was translating into risks on communities, so they were experiencing um, risks, so social risks themselves. Um, but there is a mechanism by which communities through conflict uh, can create risk on companies, so business risk to companies. So there's an interplay between risk there, and we were able to definitively show that, you know, a cost of a, a, a shutdown of an operation for, you know, a week is $20 million odd, um, $20 million or so, um, which is a very significant amount of money. Yeah. So there's an interplay between all the different risks um, that, uh, that operate between environment, social and economic. So they're the kind of observations I had um, thinking about the, the questions that you raised. Thank you. Dylan, would you like to pick this up and say something about your background? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, it's a real privilege to be here, especially because I didn't have to prepare a presentation. I just get to come up here and have a chat. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, um, yeah, my name is Dylan McFarland. I work for PACT, which is an NGO, which <clears throat> you've probably never heard about. It's a but probably one of the largest NGOs you've never heard about. It's uh, 4,000 employees in about 30 countries doing health, uh, governance, uh, livelihoods, microfinance, that sort of stuff, but also mining. And you're all aware of conflict minerals, and so you will know PACT through ITSKI. So the ITSKI system in DRC in Great Lakes region 
is run by PAC personnel on the ground. So um, the team there goes out and visits about 400 mine sites, uh, over 50,000 miners um, every month, and that's the, the bag and tag system which is used to trace tin, tungsten, and tantalum. And in terms of tungsten and tin, it's not very significant, but over half the world's tantalum goes through that system and therefore ends up in, in your phones and, and computers. Um, I've got lots of questions, and I had like a, a few um, points here. I think I'm only going to go on to one, um, which might be like maybe a, a question for, for Sarah or Natalia, um, but it's around this issue of um, transparency of data and um, large-scale mining companies reflecting on um, when they've failed. Um, so we've had lots of fantastic uh, transparency initiatives, um, and there's a whole slew of things that, that Daniel has brought up and that Francis brought up. Um, I really like this diagram that Francis had that showed all these initiatives, and there was a box near the bottom which had results. Um, mining companies are run by financiers and lawyers, and if you want to actually learn why tailings dams failed or why some technical aspects failed, you can't get at that data and that knowledge and that learning. And so it takes, it can take five years or 10 years for that information to, to come out. So this is gonna be one of my uh, questions or comments about how do we engage large scale miners to become more interested in opening up you know, when things go wrong and not just you know aggregating data that goes into the GRI indicators, but actually sharing you know these engineering reflections with us. Which I, of you wishes to pick this up? Yeah, I can start. Yeah. Um, I did look um, some time ago at um, corporate social responsibility reports of mining companies, and um, it is not only um, a fault of mining companies. It's um, um, unfortunately, the practice um, all, um, across all um, major companies is this non-reporting on negative issues, right? So um, there is also currently a lot of discussion about uh, CSR hypocrisy um, in what you declare as you would want to do and what your performance is um, or what you report at, um, against those um, um, strategies and targets that, that you set up as a company. So, um, unfortunately, there are no, there is no hard regulation to um, um, to to put to account um, companies if they do not report on some of these negative impacts or some um, uh, accidents. Um, obviously, we have this voluntary um, standards such as GRI, A, 1000s, and so forth that are helpful, that call companies to do, um, you know, be more open about the negative incidences if they happen. Um, however, there is no mechanism as such to, um, to go against that. Um, saying that, I mean, um, there are developments in the financial sector. Um, this could be ESG indicators and the um, social responsible investment that track down um, this performance, but also stock exchanges increasingly around the world um, demand companies to disclose <coughs> some of this information. So there might be um, some additional um, pressures from the financial sector to disclose this information and perhaps would be much more potent. Um, in terms of um, regulation, nas national regulation, obviously the, the, there is regulation um, around the world and in some instances is working much more, and it's open to the public, such as in Australia uh, and so forth. But in some countries, in developing countries, in emerging markets, uh, that's more difficult to trace and monitor, and then also to relate this information to the public so that it's transparent to the public. So yes, it is a challenging question, um, but I think there, there are certain solutions that keep, can be found in the voluntary sector, sort of from the industry, subscribing to standards from the financial sector, putting pressures on companies to, to disclose this information, and possibly uh, from the national regulation to demand this information, make it public. Sarah. Um, yeah, so I think um, when, I, when I was working in one of the world's larger mining companies, one of my jobs was to pull together all of the data that was required for, say, GRI reporting, sustainability reporting. And it basically, there was a big aspect of that was that whilst it was great and it was great for analysis and you could compare how are we doing against other companies and so who could we go and learn from, et cetera. 
um, there was an awful lot of reporting for reporting's sake. And also, it cost a huge amount of money because my entire salary was just on collecting in data and then crunching it. Um, and, and hopefully, I was maybe worth a little bit more to the company than that. Um, so I think that there is, um, and again, it comes to this integration of we want to see what's going on within companies so companies can improve and also we can learn from them. But the data needs to be useful. And so how do you make that data useful to the, the accountant or the lawyer, et cetera, in the organization? And the way that we started doing that was by taking the sustainability information and in a, using risk-based approaches, being able to compare sustainability risks and consequences with financial, with legal, with reputational, et cetera. So we took an enterprise-wide risk management approach to it. So it was no longer environmental data. It was company data. And that then allowed us to go back and say, OK, what does our control environment look like to manage all of these risks? And so therefore, where should we be focusing that, that energy? Um, and I think this is an approach, whilst things like GRI guidelines, et cetera, are fantastic in terms of what should we be looking at, it means that when you take that prioritised risk, impact, control-based approach, that same mechanism can be scaled down for smaller companies that don't have the money available to put into people like me to sit there and crunch data all day long. Um, and so I think sometimes that helps people focus in the areas that they, that they need to as a whole. Um, also, now that I don't work inside the big mining company um, and I'm external to it, I do get to go and play with other mining companies, but I also use other data sets to spy on them, like satellite data. You can tell so much from satellite data about what's going on within tailings facilities, etc. and lots of that data is freely available. Um, though, um, the stuff that you can go and buy is coming down in price every single day, and there are lots of fantastic startups, etc., out there that can help us analyse that data. So, yes, while transparency of information is really important from companies, being cognizant of why are you collecting that data, and so therefore what is the quality of that data, but then also where else can we get data from given developments in technology? I'd like to open this up if there's any out there who wishes to comment on what they've heard or raise another matter? Who wants to put their hand up? Richard, well done. Thank you. Yeah, we had some really interesting discussions. The thing I wanted to raise was legacy. We, we haven't really talked a great deal about legacy. We have mentioned it, but not talked about it. And I just wondered whether um, we could talk a bit about that, about can we plan uh, what the post-mining legacy should look like ahead of scale? Because we don't know where technology is going to go. You know, we've heard it that you know, during the mining, technology might change. But do you think it would be helpful to know what you're going to create at the end of your post-mining landscape, be it economic, social, environmental, Biodiversity, I mentioned the biodiversity because nobody's talked about that yet. Um, it, would that be a helpful way to sort of look? And it would be a way of engaging the local community because you could sort of say, well, you're going to end up with this and all of these things are going to be uh, positives and there will be a few negatives. And then you've got a better thing to benchmark what the end game is going to look like to sell to all the stakeholders. So I don't know whether people want to discuss that. Um, one thing I would, I would put into that that's kind of interesting to happen is, is you know, terraforming and um, you know, using the natural um, <coughs> geomorphology of a landscape. So I'm kind of talking about uh, tailings and mine waste, um, which is a, a big issue. <clears throat> These are very expensive facilities to construct and maintain um, and close. And you know, some of the new engineering thinking is that you know, we need to mimic the natural environment. And you know, that's come across from lots of sectors. In terms of mine waste, these big geometric, you know, perfectly, you know, three one slope design structures, they're going to erode and fail over some, you know, time scale. It might be 50 years, it might be 200 years. I think one thing we need to do is kind of around the, the time scales used for those, you know, extreme events that go into um, engineering facilities. But this whole designing around the natural environment is a kind of an interesting thing the mining industry is taking up on a voluntary approach right now. If you go down to the China clay mines in, in Cornwall, you'll see them doing this on some of the new um, Gosmore um, area. But it hasn't really taken off, you know, in Chile in the big copper mines. Um, 
but it's kind of a, an interesting kind of engineering approach that will will support the longer term aspects. So. I think, Rich, just to pick up on your biodiversity point, and that's it's incredibly important. And I think with me, when you start talking about biodiversity and legacy, it's difficult for us because most regulations or guidelines suggest we need to return that environment to how it was. But the problem is we've got such long time scales, mm -hmm. the climate and the environment has changed round about mm -hmm. us. And I think there are examples of um, iron ore mines in southern Africa that actually it will be very difficult for them to close because they need to return the biodiversity to something that no longer exists given the current climate. Um, and so this is something that, yes, while we need to envisage the future, that's something that probably needs to be refreshed on a regular basis, as mentioned in, in the last talk. Um, because those mines that are in planning now, so they're 10 years away from being built, we don't know how they're going to be operated necessarily, exactly, but we can take a guess at it. Um, so, yeah, I think in terms of legacy, there's the legacy on site and being cognizant of the changing world, but then also the broader legacy, so not just thinking about the social engagement in the local communities, actually what's the legacy going to be for that country or that region as a whole, maybe going across into things like the aggregates, et cetera, as well. Daniel, you wanted to yeah, comment? Uh, I, I mean, when I think about legacy, you can think about it from lots of different perspectives. Um, <laughs> There's obviously what you do with the physical environment, but there's also the legacy for the society from what you've done. Um, I just think we should be really sober about it. Um, how many mines are actually going to close properly? How many have closed properly in the past? None? I mean, less than 1%, right? In large-scale mining uh, in Queensland, Australia, where I'm from, we have maybe around 100 large-scale mines just in my state. Uh, we've relinquished three, and that's in maybe the best regulated, one of the best regulated mining places in the world, and we're only talking about licensed projects, right? So even in large-scale mining, we've almost closed no mines. Um, and then in small-scale mining, that's never, none of those are going to be rehabilitated at all. So we need to be really sober about what we would need to do to actually change the dynamics around it. We can be positive and say, yes, we're, we're doing X, Y, and Z with closure planning now. We've got financial instruments, et cetera, that can maybe help. Um, but we've not done a good job in that space. Um, the second point um, I was going to make about that is that uh, we need to change the, at least in large-scale mining, our metrics for um, deciding what's economic and what's not if we want to close mines properly. So NPV, to me, if we're going to discount future costs, is not an adequate framework for um, uh, having a mining sector that will um, leave long-term positive legacies in, in the physical and social environment. Um, and then we need better regulation as well. We need to rethink the instruments that we're using currently for mine closure. I, I was just going to say uh, I agree with a lot of what you said, Daniel, I put my hand up before you started speaking, so, uh, but uh, I think that biodiversity, uh, to be controversial, is just a distraction, actually. Uh, you know, uh, land use, uh, mining land use is trivial compared to agriculture. Uh, I think agriculture, we've seen massive strides forward technologically in agriculture. I think if we're going to, if we want biodiversity, that's the place to, to challenge uh, the farmers of this world to put biodiversity in, and we should be spending much more of our time on the social impacts of, uh, of, of, of creating these honey pots of wealth uh, in, the, in the closure process of the mines. We haven't closed a lot of mines. I doubt the area, the land use area, is the size of Oxfordshire, probably. In, uh, I don't know what it is, but it's tiny in, in, on, a global, on a global scale. So. Uh, yes, big companies always talk about biodiversity, but actually, I think that uh, that's the easy bit, um, and they're being distracted by that by doing the easy bit when the hard bit is the social honey potting, and actually, that's where we should focus. I can see several hands which are <laughs> up in the air and people wishing to speak, but Gavin has been sitting at the back and is very patient. Then we'll come to David, and then we'll come to you, so. Okay, um, okay I have uh, quite a few ideas, so I'm going to try to 
make sense of some of them here. Um, I think there's a lot of um, barking up the wrong trees. Um, you know, large-scale mining is, has come under the microscope in, in developing countries, particularly in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, because there's, there's nothing else. Um, and it shouldn't be the only thing. And not to, not to bring up um, artisanal and small-scale mining again, but because we haven't done much with that sector and any other sectors, large-scale mining is the focus. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's about a, really a sharing of data. I, I think it's just being realistic with what large-scale mining is about. Uh, people, and, and we researchers aren't doing a, a good job of this. I mean, we, we go into these countries and we conduct research and we, we criticize corporate social responsibility, the outputs of corporate social responsibility, and we, we don't even understand the process. You know, we, we go into a community and say, well, why did this mining company build a school here when there are no teachers? Or why did this mining company build a library when no one can read? in this community? Well, I mean, the answer is that we're dealing with an amorphous body here. We're dealing with different levels of management. We're dealing with decisions that go through different levels of management and are ultimately um, things that are decided upon in, in the major financial centers of the world where people have no connection with these communities whatsoever. So I think as researchers, as a starting point, if we want, if we want to make data work and if we want to pressure organizations to share their data, like large-scale mining companies, we have to do a better job as researchers of researching the process and communicating that information to people who don't know how these decisions are made. And the second point is, you know, we're, we're dealing again with rent-seeking governments. You know, we're dealing with governments that are going to say whatever they want to say at these international meetings. And, you know, I can say this because I'm an academic and I don't really have any ties to any donor body or any any mining company or anyone in the private sector or any NGO, I can say this with, with you know, fairly freely, that we're dealing with rent-seeking governments. The pressure has to be exerted on the World Bank and these major donors that are providing support and catalyzing investment in the large-scale mining space. And until that is sorted out, we're going to constantly have these large-scale mining companies pretty much doing whatever they want. And, you know, I, I understand large-scale mining is very important and that revenue if harnessed properly, can do a lot of good things in these developing countries. But the bottom line is, and I don't care what anyone says, a social license to operate does not apply in Africa, in these most of these mining communities. And I'll, I'll leave you with this. This is how I know. Um, a gentleman that, that used to work at Newmont uh, told me this, and he said, you know, we need a social license to operate here, da 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 da, -da. Um, You know what, Gavin? We screwed up in the US, we screwed up in Peru, we screwed up in Australia, we screwed up in Indonesia, but we're going to get it right here in Ghana. Now, if a social license to operate applied, they wouldn't have had entry to Ghana in the first place. <laughs> Let's get some more comments from out there. David. Uh, yes, um, the situation, of course, is, is very complicated, as, as these things always are. And I wanted to just reflect upon a meeting which we held of the European Federation of Geologists in Newcastle a couple of years ago, which was entitled Mining in a Crowded Country. And we, we chose Newcastle because, of course, there's a legacy of mining there, and indeed there's active mining there that uh, currently uh, affects coal. And we, we heard about the potash deposits in um, Yorkshire, which are world class, uh, that are coming on stream, or have been constructed, I should say. And uh, the legacy of mining for metals in the northeast of England goes back two or three hundred years, if not further. That is a, a, an ore field of several hundred square kilometres with a tremendous legacy of social activity right from the start all the way through to the present day. We see the mining of coal. We have the surface mining of coal in big open pits still in the area, big by British standards, uh, where you only get permission to put a pit like that in on the basis of the quality of the restoration and what the, the site will be used for afterwards. We see issues there with the temporary storage of topsoil, generating biodiversity in the form of orchids and hares and other things, which then has to be destroyed to restore the mine. So many things are unpredictable, and every situation is unique. We have to be ever so careful to be flexible with this and make sure that as we move forward, we keep these, all these matters in balance so that the eventual outcome is the one that we want, which is to ensure that we have the materials that we need to achieve the SDGs, for want a better way of putting it. We, we have to move in that direction and recognize that there are lessons from history which we need to learn. That history is here on our doorsteps in, in the United Kingdom. 
where artisanal mining has taken place in the miners' strike in 1984, there was artisanal mining of coal. These things go on, they don't go away, the same drivers are there, it doesn't matter whether you're in the north of England or in, in an African country, it's still there, the same sort of thing that affects people. I've said a lot, I'm going to shut up. <laughs> All right. Let's have another comment. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to raise one issue that th th Sarah Gordon may, may have raised in her talk, and that's the fly-in, fly-out miners. Do you feel this is sustainable? And, and the extreme example of this I came across was flying Canadian miners into Gergizia to mine gold. It, 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 how do you feel this is going to go? That's a very specific thing. Do you want that's, to react to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, that fly-in, fly-out um, has its place. Um, and it's a case where depending on that particular site and where it is, it keeps um, the infrastructure and the footprint perhaps that you need round about a site to a minimum. I think that actually going forwards into the future, one of the main uh, uh, value propositions for automation, for example, is not having to have people fly in, fly out. So, for example, take lots of the mines in Australia. Um, I don't know what aspects specifically with regards to fly in, fly out. Well, if you can automate mine, do you have people living or just have them fly in? I think it depends on which um, jobs you're automating on the mine. I think you're always going to have to have somebody there. Um, and um, so, therefore, there will still be an aspect of people going in and out of those sites. But you're reducing the number of people and, therefore, footprint and, therefore, impacts on biodiversity. Because biodiversity isn't just the mine footprint. It is all of the trees that you're cutting down for the struts underneath them, you know, within the mine. It's the, the agriculture that you're creating for the people that are living in that community. So it goes, it goes on and it's broader. Um, so I think if you're reducing the number of people who are physically going to be there, you're actually just reducing the full scale of a potential problem. Might be hypothesized. Nick has a... I have a question which has been kind of festering, building in my mind since yesterday afternoon. Um, when we were talking about where are we going to get this stuff from and we got started to get onto the question of actually can, can we get all this stuff, not in the sense of running out, but are we going to, is it possible to meet these needs that we've convened to, to talk about? If we didn't have the Sustainable Development Goals and if we didn't have the Paris COP21 agreement, in other words, if, if we weren't having to deal with uh, carbon emissions and if we didn't care about and were happy to live with social injustice and not look after sustainable global development, we'd still have a minerals challenge. We'd still have a lot that we needed to do. If we were thinking about some of the issues we've been talking about this morning as to whether you do that in a way which is even socially or environmentally acceptable at a local level, we'd have big challenges. But on top of that, we have got these two enormous challenges. And we've started to get some hints this morning of some of these things being in quite significant tension. Um, so I suppose my question is, and we can, uh, people might comment on it, or otherwise we could leave it hanging till the session I'll be chairing this afternoon, thinking about the roadmap and the way forward. What's the poorest cousin in the room? What gives if we don't get everything right? And I think it was Andrew yesterday who said, we kind of need to do everything and tackle all these issues and do all the recycling and the reduction in use and to get near this. But if we don't get near it, or even if we do get near it, but some of this gives, what gives? Do we not do sustainable development because we're, I'm putting it in, in extreme terms now, but you know, do you not do sustainable development because you're, you care about carbon emissions more? Do you let the carbon emissions go up because of sustainable development? What do you sort of mean? How do we prioritize? Who wants to start? Okay. Uh, maybe I'll start. Um, I'll be cheeky and flip it. Is the sustainable development goals help us to find the things that we can accelerate that integrates multiple goals, right? It, what are the, the opposite of what you're saying is what are the kind of few things that we could do that would have an impact on lots of things? Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and I think both are useful, right? Thinking of what we have to give up, but also what are the synergies? What can we do that will create lots of um, impact uh, by just changing one or two things? Catherine? I think... It's an interesting question, the interactions of everything, but of course we have to remember that some of the issues around the sustainable development goals are there because in some of the world's poorest countries you've got populations growing so fast, those populations moving into urban centres, 
And those are problems that partly have to be addressed by things like building economies and, and providing good sustainable lives and livelihoods. And often that's where the mining side comes into things, is that it's, it's part of solving problems that the sustainable development goals are there to try and solve. Um, and I, I've just been really struck in the last five or ten minutes by the conversations, and I almost feel like we're having two different conversations in this room. There's one group of people talking about things like automation and helicopter flights and, and careful you know, attempts at mine closure and getting all the biodiversity right. And all those things are very important for us sitting in the UK. They're big priorities. And then there's another group of people talking principally about Africa and about developing countries, where the concerns that we've really got are around things like, are people able to earn enough money to you know, maybe send their children to school? Or actually, are their children having to work in the mines with them using mercury? And those kinds of issues. And those two sets of issues are, are really different. And there's something that really struck me in Natalia's talk. You used your 2014 figures, and you showed that Sierra Leone had 86% of its exports from mining. And that was true from 2012 to about 2014, because there's two big iron ore mines in Sierra Leone. And for a very short period, they both operated. They both provided a certain number of jobs. They both provided money into the economy. And then a combination of a drop in global iron ore prices and the absolute health crisis that was Ebola closed those two iron ore mines. And that figure would have looked very different if you'd taken 2016 figures. And that shows just how much mining can be important to some countries in sub-Saharan Africa and how much difference these changes can make. And so I think when we're talking about sustainable development, I think Gavin already said it, the problems in Africa are enormous and really quite different to some of the other things we're talking about. Everybody else want to say um, Yes, um, in continuation, um, I just wanted to make um, a, a point. So I think what is important in, in order to set priorities for organizations or nations, and I think an in, in important approach would be collaboration, right? Um, open conversations, uh, not only within the industry to be building consensus, but with other sectors, with other organizations, with governments, maybe with international organizations as well. I think collaboration is very uh, key, not only between the different organizations and sectors, but across the supply chain and making sure, obviously, mining is a base for all um, industries that we have. So bringing closer and, and, and spreading the knowledge down to the consumer and sharing the responsibility within the supply chain as well. So I think that's also important. So that would bring closer the countries and communities that consume important minerals and metals that are mined in developing countries to those needs in developing countries. So I think those two points would be important. Can I be very provocative? Not. The theme of this discussion is in part how can we share the benefits and risks of mining more fa fairly, all right? Which is loaded because it implies that they're not shared fairly at the present time. Now, does anybody wish to claim that they are fairly shared? And if they're not fairly shared, how do we change that? Because if I go and talk to African colleagues in particular, they feel that their mineral wealth is being taken from them in a quite unfair way, and it's in a sense neo-colonialism. They have already had one bout of people extracting their wealth, and they're therefore quite ambivalent about large-scale mining if the potential wealth of their indigenous resource is essentially exported from them, and they don't feel that that's on a fair basis. Now, who wants to react to that? Um, I'll have a go, and I'm not going to fall into that elephant trap that you've set in front of me by saying <laughs> yes, it is distributed. Um, 
Um, I, think, I think it's a case where um, the, the trend at the moment is obviously we're, we're getting more, you know, we're getting more and more of the world's wealth being concentrated in fewer and fewer people. So that distance between the wealthy and the poor is getting bigger, mm -hmm. which is the polar opposite direction to where the sustainable development goals are, are trying to take us. Um, and there are many, there are many reasons for that as a whole. Um, ways in which I guess the sector are, are trying to address that and governments are trying to address that at the moment. Um, well, I mean, we heard from Daniel earlier on, things like um, industrial minerals, for example, those are things that can be uh, mined or quarried in country, used in that particular region. So they're not being lost out away from that community. Also things like beneficiation in country. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're upscaling those products so that they're more valuable before they go out of that, um, out of that particular jurisdiction. Um, I think, I mean, there are so many different um, parts to play with this. Um, and it's a case, again, where, I mean, we're, at the moment, global society is becoming uh, more fragmented again. I mean, we've seen what's been going on in the US, here in the UK, we've got exactly the same sort of sentiments going. But ultimately, um, a country is not a closed system. But planet Earth, for most aspects, is a closed system. Mm -hmm. And we're here in the geological society. So we're, we're actually the people who understand what underpins all of that. Um, and I think that that's perhaps where we need to go back to to try and understand where those flows of how do we share the wealth comes from because our minerals are not concentrated equally and I know that that particular sentence doesn't make sense. Um, so um, it's, it's about looking at things on that macro global scale rather than um, looking at things in the silos which is perhaps what we want to do at the moment. We can't look at Africa in isolation, we have to look at Africa in the context of the wider world. Okay. Daniel, do you have a <laughs> contribution wish, wish to make? Um, Thoughts to share? Well, yeah, I, I would just say that one way we can, and I think this is echoing what Sarah just said, uh, one way that we can ensure that things are more fair is to focus on the commodities that are going to lead to development. And um, if we are, as an international development community, only focusing on the commodities that the developed world needs, then we're uh, not uh, meeting that challenge. So. Uh, that's what we're doing with our program is trying to focus on commodities that lead to domestic development and to support uh, those small scale miners to um, empower themselves um, through capacity building and skills to organise themselves into cooperatives to um, share knowledge, so South to South Knowledge Exchange so we can understand what are the potentials for um, the use of, uh, of the, the commodities uh, in, in uh, value-added ways, um, and to uh, think about the diverse ways in which minerals can can uh, support those societies. Uh, on the on the other side, on the large-scale mining side, I think that there is a huge challenge, a huge challenge around um, the idea that you could beneficiate locally. We've talked about that for decades, um, and we've mainly come, a lot of African governments have now come to the conclusion that it's the backward linkages that can be better harnessed, not the forward linkages, and it's actually really very difficult in the economic climate to, to, to generate those forward linkages. Um, so I think it's a, it's a huge challenge and it will affect the appetite that African uh, countries and, and Asian and Caribbean and Pacific countries will have in the future around providing the metals needed for the developed world. Does anybody have any last things that they wish to say before we have lunch? <laughs> Does anybody wish to say anything from out there? I, I, just one reflection that, you know, talking about two conversations. And I, you know, we focused a lot, quite rightly, on the developing world this morning, but you don't have to go very far from London to find the direct impact of the resource curse. The poorest communities in this country, you think about where they are, they're West Cornwall, they're South Wales, they're the North East where Des was talking about, they're where I come from in Barnsley. And there's a common factor that links all those communities. And that's mining. And the fact is where I come from, we're on the third generation of people who are still suffering from mine pollution the impact of mine closures 30, 40 years ago. 
And you know that that's what we're dealing with. This isn't this isn't just a, a, a problem confined to the developing world. We're still living with a legacy in this country, and we're still dealing with it really badly. And that's both from a social point of view and an environmental point. Of view. Okay. We should break for lunch, for which you have 41 minutes and a little less. Would you please help me in thanking the speakers and yourself?